<laughs> that's that's your leverage. <laughs> like, you working on these four hours. Charging fees. <laughs> and we we've just got uh, started recording. Okay, so we're ready to go. We're ready to go. I'd like to call the July 12th, 2023 meeting of the Open Space Board of Trustees to order and welcome to everyone who is joining us. Uh, we have a pretty packed agenda tonight, so uh, we'll review um, it specifically after I call the roll. So I will do that. Uh, Michelle? Here. Brady? Here. John? Present. And I'm Dave, and I'm here as well. So we do have a quorum. Um, our next item is approval of minutes from um, our special meeting on May 31st, 2023, and our regularly scheduled meeting of June 14th, 2023. Does anyone have any additions or corrections to the minutes for the May 31st meeting? Seeing none, um, could I ask for a motion to approve? So moved. And in a second. Second. Thank you. Um, I'll call again, Michelle. Yes. Brady. Yes. And John. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that passes unanimously. The minutes uh, for June 14th, 2023. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, and I please have a motion. And a second. Second. Thank you. Um, Michelle? Uh, Approve. Oh, you. yeah, here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ready? Yes. And John? Yes. And I as well. So uh, those minutes passed unanimously. So we will now proceed to public comments, but before we start that, uh, let me just take a couple of minutes to uh, run through uh, the agenda. And some of this will relate to the public comments. Uh, we have uh, three public hearings scheduled this evening. So folks who would like to speak to uh, those issues that have public hearings um, should do so at that time. And I will go through uh, those uh, in a minute, uh, what those specific items are. Otherwise, we'll follow our usual public comment protocol, which um, Megan will recognize uh, the person who wants to comment. And you will have three minutes to do that, I think. Is that right, Megan, as far as you know? So we're, we're okay. So we have th uh, three minutes to comment. Um, so if you could uh, adhere to that, uh, we have a, a, a long agenda and would like to move through it as expeditiously as we can. The three public hearings, um, the first one will be a public hearing in consideration of a motion recommending approval of the proposed open space related land use changes in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Land Use Map within the Boulder Junction phase two area to the planning board and city council. So if you'd like to speak to that issue, um, please hold your comments until then. Uh, the second public hearing will be a review of and recommendations regarding the 2024 Open Space and Mountain Parks Department Capital Improvement Program budget, a portion of the 2024 Library Fund Capital Improvement Program budget and 2024 Open Space and Mountain Parks Department operating budget. So if you'd like to speak to the department's budget, uh, that would be the time to do that. In our final public hearing, as a request for a recommendation to staff to implement modifications to the management program, reducing prairie dog conflict on irrigated agricultural lands, and a recommendation to city council to amend the geographic scope of the program to include the Northern project area with the addition of all irrigated agricultural lands designated as transition or removal areas across the entire open space and mountain parks land system. So if you'd like to speak to that item, uh, please hold your comments until then. Uh, without further ado, we will uh, start public comment.
Sam, will you go through the protocol? Yes, I will go through the protocol. Should be sharing just now. Sorry about that. It was taking me a second to get that up and running. So the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff and board commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement processes, please visit this website that's linked here. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. So as Dave mentioned, we have one section for public comment for items not identified for public hearing, and then three sections identified for public hearing. If you've signed up to speak, um, you will be called on to speak. If you um, would like to speak tonight, you can raise your hand. Uh, you'll either see a raised hand icon at the bottom. If you don't see that, you can click on that participants icon, and then you'll see three dots show up on the bottom and click raise hand from there. I don't see anyone joining by phone yet, but if you do join by phone, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Great, thank you. And Megan, will you lead us? Yes, and we're gonna get started first with uh, public comment for items not identified for public hearing. Um, and first we have uh, Wendy Sweet followed by Patricia Billig. So um, Wendy, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, I am Wendy Sweet, and I'm the executive director of the Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance. I wanted to comment on the change in e-bike regulations and the work I've been doing with the Boulder County Audubon Society since the June 1st City Council hearing. Yes, you heard that right. We have been cooperating together on a common goal. Stay tuned for next month when we announce a solution to climate change and world peace. Our groups are very much interested in OSMP visitor use data and how staff will collect and use this data for adaptive management practices. We have had great conversations with Jeff Haley, heads of trails and facilities, and Francis Boulding, recreation and cultural stewardship senior manager who oversees the human dimension team. Because of these conversations, OSMP installed new multi-use trail counter devices on the White Rocks Trail and the South Boulder Creek Trail to increase data collection. Francis also provided us with initial visitor survey and visitation estimate data for these sites that were not yet public, and we are very much appreciative of their quick response. Thank you. A common data set that staff and stakeholders all agree on is crucial for making decisions about current and future visitor access. After our meetings with staff, I feel confident we are all on the right track. The next step will be agreeing on adaptive management criteria and outcomes based on this data. And I look forward to continuing to partner with the Boulder County Audubon Society and other interested stakeholders on this step. The second item I'd like to bring up is that old no e-bike signage and incorrect maps may still be in place in some locations. I've anecdotally heard of bikers not knowing the correct regulations after July 1st and of e-bikers being told by other visitors they were not allowed on the trail. Correct information and signage will reduce these unnecessary visitor conflicts. The Boulder Mountain Bike Patrol is planning some outreach events on this topic too, following our directive to inform and educate all open space visitors. It's my hope that e-bike regulations continue to be a topic of discussion for OSBT as current use is monitored and future use is considered. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and just as a quick aside, um, the board will uh, be updated by Dan uh, later in the meeting on uh, the e-bike e uh, 
implementation. So um, if you're still there, here or there, um, uh, that will happen uh, somewhat later. Thank you. Um, and then next signed up, we have Patricia Billing, and that would be the end of um, our list for people who have signed up in advance. So Patricia, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Wendy. She, uh, I'm, my name is Pat Bildig. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of Boulder County Audubon Society and also as a previous board member. Uh, Wendy uh, did a great summary of what we've been working on together. And uh, one of our objectives is to, for, and why, why I'm speaking at this meeting, is to learn whether the steps for adaptive management in the city of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks Department guidelines for adaptive management are being followed. According to this document presented to OSBT at your March 2023rd meeting, these steps are to be followed under certain conditions, such as when there's high stakeholder, stakeholder interest and involvement, which has been demonstrated by the large number of residents and open space visitors who spoke at both the OSBT and the city council meetings um, and the op-ed and letters to the editor and the camera. And when there are potential and sometimes considerable potential threats to the quality of the visitor experience and wildlife resources and uncertainty about the results of an action um, that that's all in the adaptive management plan. As you're aware, we still have controversy regarding visitor displacement on trails open to bicycle use on the Dowdy Draw and Springbrook trails in Marshall Mesa because there was no protocol in place to collect data for adaptive management purposes when the use of those trails was changed. Please consider the current implementation of e-bike use on selected trails east of Broadway to be an important case in a pilot study for applying the steps of the adaptive management guidelines that you approved in March of this year. In step one, um, and the steps are all outlined clearly, but the, in step one, there's so OSMP staff are to confirm their approach for adaptive management with the, with the board. Um, and we're at, one of the things we'd like to know is if that, if you have done this, and if not, we're requesting that you ask the staff, the OSBT staff, to do three things. One, present to you their baseline data, of which they have some, especially for the two trails located in HCAs and natural areas, South Boulder Creek and White Rocks trails, and how they intend to monitor changes in both visitor and wildlife use. Two, present to you their desired user and resource management protection criteria and thresholds for change, management change, and identify alternatives should the thresholds be exceeded. Your leadership as trustees of OSMP lands is crucial in ensuring that these guidelines are implemented to protect both natural resources and user experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. It's always Good to hear from uh, past board members. So uh, thank you for that. And as I said previously, uh, we'll uh, have an update uh, later in the meeting on the e-bike implementation uh, situation. And we do have one more hand. Um, and just a reminder, if you'd like to raise your hand to speak during this section, uh, you can do so. And then I do see one participant on the phone. You can press star nine if you'd like to speak. <laughs> Um, so uh, we have a hand from Lynn Siegel, and I'm going to, uh, Lynn, you should be able to unmute yourself. Once again, um, I don't, I'm not talking to three minutes. I'm talking to the board. I ask you again, could you please, like other boards, put up the board I know that I don't get to, you know, you don't get to see me. Obviously you don't want to, or you would, um, because this is so archaic. It's four years, coming on four years ago that we have COVID and this is, this is just ridiculous. Um, I am really disheartened. As you well know, I've written you plenty. I really don't think anything of this board anymore, nothing. 
And this is open space. This is everything Boulder means. But there is a missing seat of a dedicated public servant that you fired and you had no business firing, no business at all. She spoke truth to power. She expressed the fact that Rachel was doing clear overreach between the council. You know, your board advises council. Council doesn't advise the board. They don't advise the board to the extent they don't, they don't have a backdoor deal on a multiplier for the land disposal at CU South, which then got the wrong wording that everyone thought that they were voting against CU went by saying no and no meant yes. It's unconscionable. It's egregious. This kind of thing is not supposed to happen in a quote unquote educated progressive town. Caroline expressed in so many ways what was really going on. And if you had a problem with that, you should have fired her three years ago, but you didn't. Something else happened. I don't know what happened, Dave. I don't know what happened, but I know something happened between November 9th when she brought these things up and there was never any discussion. I went to every board meeting and I thought, well, that was weird that that happened. But then the board meetings went on just like usual. And the way you slaughtered her on May 31st, there is no excuse for anyone to do something like that to, to someone who's worked so hard and had 30 times she showed up before the four times within six months, 30 times she showed up without one absence. How dare you, Done. Ben, thank you for your comments. Do we have anyone else, Sam? Uh, no other hands. Great. Uh, that closes uh, the public comment. And uh, before we get into matters from the board, um, I would like to have Dan uh, recognize a longtime uh, employee of the uh, Mountain Parks Division for the city of Boulder uh, who passed away recently and uh, meant a lot to a lot of us. Um, on June 30th, we lost a, a member of our family. Uh, at Open Space Mountain Parks with the passing of, of Dick Lyman, who was uh, our first paid park ranger and later became to head up our, our, our ranger team. And um, I wasn't around during Dick's uh, time. I gave you were, right? And we still have some employees that worked alongside Dick for a few years. And in fact, one of those employees who recently uh, retired, uh, Steve Armstead, was deputy director of Open Space Mount Park and first uh, started his career as a ranger and grew up under the tutelage of Dick. And uh, Steve wrote a few paragraphs uh, about uh, Dick that I would like to uh, read into the record and to acknowledge uh, the importance that, uh, uh, that Mr. Lyman had uh, on the department. So this is Steve's words, not mine. So if I use the word my, it's Steve talking at this point in time. Open Space and Mountain Parks lost a longtime, lifelong champion and steward with the passing of Dick. His long tenure as a ranger and manager for the Mountain Parks Division will forever have an imprint of his presence. Today, you can't walk on a mountain trail, enjoy a view from Flagstaff, Green Mountain, Royal Arch, look out at Chautauqua Mart, uh, Meadow from the Ranger Cottage, or watch a sunset from Sawhill Ponds and not be in a space that wasn't cared for and benefited by Dick's years of labor and care. His decades of passion to protect these spaces also included helping many visitors learn about, enjoy, and appreciate the natural wonders of these spaces. Beyond Dick's decades of uh, caretaking of the land and living things, Dick had a huge caretaking career for youth. Perhaps there's no bigger long-term benefit or impact to OSMP and the Boulder community that can be contributed to Dick than the Junior Ranger Program, 
Without his belief in the program, his constant work to secure support and funding to get the program off the ground and to keep it going through its initial wobbly years when it's needed, when its need and value wasn't so clearly understood, his commitment to the idea made it possible for the thousands of teenagers over the years to be part of the Junior Ranger legacy. And for what he has meant to me, as well as to many other staff that have and some that still work for OSMP, is a role model of how to be a public servant, a naturalist, and supportive peer and leader. Dick had an uncanny ability to trust those he worked with, respect and encourage unique qualities, and make others feel appreciated. He loved helping others grow and learn, and upon a stumble, was usually the first to let you know you'd be fine and to encourage you to keep on going. Dick would usually have a good story or remembrance for some, mis for some mistake he made, giving you a complete recount of the event. And before long, you'd soon forgotten your own goof and moved on because now you were drawn away by Dick's story. He had an amazing memory and a story for every situation. I'll miss his ability to bring the past events of OSMP to be a part of the present. In remembering Dick's life, we should all celebrate how big a contribution he made to what we all experience at OSMP. I know him, I owe him such gratitude for underpinning my own decades of service to this department, and I'm just one of many. So words of Steve Armstead, and we send our condolences out to Dick's family. Thank you, Dan. And I would just add that, um, you know, Dick uh, started out working for the city um, and he, he, as Dan mentioned, and Steve uh, recognized as well, was uh, one, of, one of the first, if not, um, well, he wasn't the first, but he was one of a very few employees uh, for the Mountain Parks Division uh, when the city uh, decided to staff the Parks Department. And uh, so he, he single-handedly, uh, you know, managed the Mountain Parks uh, land system that uh, the Open Space and Mountain Parks program now has uh, 145 some uh, staff members. Um, so he uh, he did yo person's uh, service throughout his his career. He's a great guy, and uh, I really enjoyed working with him as well. So thanks. thanks. Yeah. Uh, so with that. Uh, we will go to matters from the board. Um, and the first item is whether we have any comments or questions on the written information that we got in our packet, which is uh, about the Boulder Star on Flagstaff Mountain. So do any board members have uh, any comments or questions on that? John, okay. Um, and uh, Jeff, you and I have talked. Uh, we, uh, I think, at some point in the near future, would like to uh, get uh, some cost estimates for you know kind of what we're anticipating. Uh, it will the cost will be for us to kind of take over the management of the star. Absolutely. So we we'll look look forward to that. Yep. Uh, are there other matters from the board? I have one. Um, I was wondering if you could provide us with an update of the open seat that we have on OSDT yes. and how that process is, like where that is. Yeah, I can give you an update right now. Um, so uh, there was a call for any more applicants uh, for the open board and community seats citywide, which included now one seat for open space and mountain parks. Um, we had a, uh, a total of five applicants. Um, uh, interviews are all complete. Um, that process is now closed. On August 3rd, uh, there will be council selection of the open seats, which includes the open board of trustees seat, and the term will be effective immediately. So that does mean uh, upon availability of the of a new trustee that August 9th OSBT meeting would be a swearing in opportunity for that member. And you'll of course work with Dave to uh, get all that information that you would need and the new trustee on uh, and if they're able to attend to uh, uh, do that swearing in ceremony and they'll term will officially begin uh, at that meeting. So that that's helpful. I just um, mm -hmm. and I know that this was not on your on the OSFP's place. 
And I was surprised to hear that the, the application process had opened and already closed and that interviews had already taken place. And I, I don't know where the breakdown is in the city. I feel like I, sh I should have been aware of that. I know I'm not on the website all the time. Um, I, I just, I think that, um, I don't know if you all knew about it. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, and it just came to me as a surprise that the process was opened and already closed. So as a trustee. <laughs> you can't been following up on that. Yeah. Did the city put out any kind of announcement or? Um, the city clerk's office is the uh, department and the staff that handles uh, boards and commissions and applications and uh, um, and the interviews were done early this week. Okay. Um, and I don't know how long the openings or there was a number of openings we were of any of uh, EBT, for instance, and several openings as well. Um, but uh, I could follow up with what the clerk's office sort of told the calls were in terms of what they followed in terms of media or outreach. Uh, yeah, I, I just don't have it at my fingertips. That's what, that's what they, I think that would be helpful, uh, especially going ahead if this um, situation would ever uh, you know, be in front of this board again, at least um, you know, we'd have a little more sense of uh, what's, sure. what's what's happening um yeah I, do we know are the interviews uh up online do you, do you know that or? um so uh all but one were applicants from the winter period in which interviews for those uh right. they expressed a continued interest to be part of consideration those interviews were conducted, I believe, that were in March of last year yeah, they or weren't earlier. Re there was one person that threw their hat in the ring that wasn't interviewed previously a few months ago, and that uh, interview uh, took place this week. And would that be available, do you know? Uh, on the I know they're all recorded. Um, so the I first, think. yeah, the original ones I know are. Um, I imagine that would be the same protocol. I can get a link to where that would be located. Yeah, and then just where the application materials are. Yeah, I I may have uh, fumbled it a little, uh, Michelle. Um, although I didn't know much more than than anyone else, I did know that uh, the uh, process was going to take place in that, uh, and I didn't know the exact closing time of the uh, applications. But I I think Dan mentioned that it was the first week in August. Or, Whatever um, the closing, the for the closing application, yeah. I think that was the actually first uh, week of July. Yeah, first week of July. 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 I meant July. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyway, um, yeah, I was probably remiss in that. At least uh, letting board know that that was the situation. But I didn't have enough detail to really do much more than that. Um, so I think that your comments are um, very appropriate. Thank you. I'll get some information out to you. So this will fulfill, this will just be the remainder of the existing term and then they'll work. That is a good question. I know that in past openings that I've been aware of, it was to fill the existing term of, of the vacant position. Um, so I'll also see if that's what council's will is in this case. I'd imagine in order to have all the terms staggered, then right. that probably will be the case. Uh, any other comments or questions on for matters from the work? You good, Brady? Uh, I'm a little annoyed, but I, I, I should have known myself, I guess. You know, I think, I think we're all invested in having the best board that we can, and it would have been nice to, for all of us to have a little bit of an opportunity to beat the tree. But uh, so be it. Yeah, we'll, it's news you lose. Well, we'll, we'll learn from that. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, so, I think we're on to our first public hearing. And I don't know who's going to. Yeah, who's leading? <laughs> uh, I'm just going to do a quick turnaround. Uh, okay. This is an item that was uh, before you for the past couple of months, one written memo and uh, a presentation last month. But uh, uh, it's in regards to the. Uh, uh, Boulder Junction Phase Two, in which John Carroll has also been participating in, but uh, 
Leading our presentation today will be Casey French, our Senior Manager of Planning and Design Services, and Julia Pennell will be supporting. So Casey. Thanks. So um, as Dan said, we're here for the Boulder Junction uh, Phase 2. And uh, more specifically, we're here to talk about the proposed, oh, I'm sorry, presentation coming up still, but the proposed <laughs> land use uh, changes to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive or BBCP map. So it's within that context. I will say we also have Christopher Johnson here this evening, and he is the comprehensive planning manager and the project manager for the Boulder Junction uh, Phase Two project. So, if there are any questions about that project in and of itself, he is here and available uh, to answer any questions. Um, so on on the screen here is the uh, OSBT uh, recommend recommendation. Um, and this is because you know, any open space designation changes to the BBCP land use map uh, require an OSBT recommendation. And we'll show this at the end uh, for you as well. Um, and for an overview um, tonight, uh, tonight's presentation will briefly cover the main topics included in the board's memo. Um, this is both for the public um, as this item has come hearing, as we know, and just a refresher for the board. And, I'll begin with an overview of the open space land use designations, uh, the history of open space mapping, uh, the current status and related efforts associated with that. And then Juliet will give some context uh, for the Boulder Junction Phase 2 project and then go over uh, the staff recommendation, our approach, and reasoning for the proposed open space land use changes. So the BBCP currently includes uh, three categories of open space. Uh, land use designations. And um, up on the slide are the BBCP definitions. So open space acquired or OSA um, is land that has already been acquired for open space purposes. Uh, open space development rights or restrictions, OSDR, um, is land with open space related conservation easements uh, or other development restrictions on it. And then open space uh, other or OSO it's a sort of historical designation. Uh, these are lands that were identified uh, prior to 1981 as lands to preserve, but that haven't been acquired or don't have development rights or restrictions on them, hence the term other. So it, it is a little confusing, and I'll go into how this designation came to be and describe it in a little bit more detail in upcoming slides um, in just a moment. But uh, the reason we're here tonight is that there is land with an OSO designation in the Boulder Junction uh, Planning area. Casey, before you go on, yeah. Sam, can we get rid of that yeah, black right. header? It, it's like, Sorry about that. But... Oh, there we, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, how did OSO come to be? So, uh, prior to 1981, uh, there was uh, just one open space map, which included just one category of open space. Um, it was aspirational and it identified lands to protect or preserve. Um, the reason for this designation or the natural resource values that existed and that were desired to protect, uh, those weren't recorded. Uh, then in 1990, uh, the open space map was combined uh, with the BBCP uh, land use map. And then and then around 1995, uh, the BBCP land use map was digitized. So in this process, staff entered what was from you know, hand-drawn mapping into mapping software that was parcel-based and extremely accurate. Um, and because of this, it resulted in some misalignments and some other types of errors. Um, and then in 2000, as part of the BBCP major update, OSMP and comprehensive planning staff worked together uh, to split out the one broad open space land use designation to reflect the three categories we went over, OSA, acquired, OSD, development rights, and then what was left over was designated eloquently as open space other. <laughs> um, 
and I think when you look at the definitions and things that might not be, you know, obvious that they're important, you know, context for understanding uh, what OSO actually means, um, you know, it's important to remember it's pre-1981 identification of lands to preserve. Um, the values or reasons are unknown because they weren't, they weren't documented. Uh, current conditions are often different from 1981. Uh, sometimes the land has been developed or the values are no longer present. And other times there's an obvious natural resource value. It really varies from parcel to parcel. Um, again, we went over that there's some errors associated with it as well. It's on private lands. Um, and the designation does not have a lot of teeth. It does not ensure protection. So when development is proposed, um, oh, and I wanted to say, and obviously there's a, there's a lot of confusion um, among the community about what OSO is. Um, there's confusion about what the resource values are and if OSMP is interested in acquiring or managing the land. Um, and it's also created some challenges during the development review process. So when development is proposed on a private parcel with an OSO land use designation, um, planning staff does reach out to OSMP staff to evaluate the natural resource values, and then planning takes that into account and issues the development per permits on the property uh, accordingly. Um, and this development review committee or DRC process, as we refer to it, um, has been ongoing for about 20 years, so a long time. And, and, and at times the board can also get involved during this, this type of process, with especially controversial uh, ones, such as like, oh, census 311, maybe since some of you might, might remember that one. Um, because of kind of the complications and confusions that can arise from OSO during the development review process, we have started to try to proactively clean up some of the OSO designations where they may not make a lot of sense. Uh, so, excited. Uh, so we have uh, reviewed and made open space and land use designation changes uh, recently as part of the Golden Valley Comprehensive Plan updates. Uh, the last minor update was in 2020, and we are scheduled for a major update in 2025. Um, and we anticipate, you know, just further exploring with comprehensive planning staff, potentially looking at other ways to clean up or make progress on that. Um, OSAP and comprehensive planning staff, we've begun uh, reviewing land use designations through subcommunity or uh, site-specific planning. So we recently did this in 2021 as part of the East Boulder subcommunity plan. And then now as part of the Boulder Junction phase two process, uh, we've really taken a close look at all the OSO within this planning area. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Juliet, who's gonna share some specifics about the project and what is being proposed. Thanks, Christy. So I wanted to start by sharing kind of the background and purpose of the Boulder Junction Phase II project. Um, the Transit Village Area Plan, or TVAP, was completed in 2007. And this plan guides the future development of Boulder Junction, which is the area around 30th Street, um, Pearl Parkway, Belmont, and Pearl Street. Um, and the Boulder Junction Phase II project includes updating the most critical elements of TVAP that no longer reflect the community's current and future needs the plan's adoption 15 years ago. TVAP identified two phases of development, um, phase one for the area west of the existing railroad tracks and phase two for the area east of the tracks. Implementation of phase one is nearing completion and so phase two is beginning. As part of this process, oh, sorry, advanced phase. <laughs> As part of this process, a multi-board working group has been convened. It includes liaisons from 10 boards with an interest in the area, and Trustee Carroll is OSBT's liaison. The working group's focus is on multidisciplinary interests and recommendations, so open space land use designations haven't been a focus of this group. Therefore, staff have been coordinating directly with Trustee Carroll in order to focus specifically on OSMP interests, open space land use designations, and recommendations. And because the working group supplements rather than replacing required board processes, we're here with you as the full board tonight to get your recommendation on the proposed open space land use designation changes to the BBCP map within this area. Here you can see a map that shows the BBCP land uses within the phase two area, including a swath of OSO. Next slide. 
And as you saw in the recommendation that we're suggesting you make to Planning Board and City Council, we're proposing two land use updates, one removal of OSO and one correction as part of this process, which I'll talk in detail about. Next slide. Um, first, we're proposing removing OSO from where the, this area where it appears. We believe this OSO was intended to protect the Boulder left-hand ditch and North Boulder farmers ditch. The areas adjacent to the ditches are um, developed and have no natural resource value and therefore aren't of interest to OSMP to protect. These ditches and the ditch company's interests are already protected by easements. So we're recommending that OSO over these already developed lands be changed to the final land use designation being recommended as part of the Boulder Junction Phase 2 project. Right now, the recommended land use is tentatively mixed use transit oriented development or MUTOD. Here you can see images showing the level of development in the area that's currently OSO. The ditches are in concrete channels and are surrounded by paved parking lots and commercial and industrial buildings. And just a few more photos showing the, the level of development and why we feel that it's really appropriate and desirable to remove the OSO designation from this area. In addition to OSO removal, we're also proposing one land use designation correction. The new Pearl Street Industrial Scenic Easement um, property shown on these maps was previously acquired through a conservation easement. So it should appear as OSDR to reflect OSMP ownership of the easement. In 2007, as part of TVAP, land uses included an OS designation indicating open space greenway over the Goose Creek Greenway. We reviewed and evaluated this greenway and found that it doesn't reflect an open space interest. So we support the currently proposed alternative of designating this area as parklands or PKUO. And because the OS TVAP designation is not a BDCP land use designation, um, OSMP does, or sorry, OSBT doesn't need to make a recommendation on this. So that's our presentation, and we're happy to answer any clarifying questions you might have. And the recommendation we're proposing that you um, recommend to Planning Board and Council is on the slide for your reference. Thanks to both of you. Uh, John, do you, as our representative to the working group, do you want to add anything or make any comment? Uh, yeah, could you provide any more background to the board on why, uh, just a little bit of history on why that small strip next to Pearl, uh, you know, what was designated or misdesignated as, as, as OSO at some point in the past, uh, I, I think that was helpful for me to understand, uh, throughout the process. Sure. There's a lot of new acronyms to learn here in kind of the back. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm making 26. You are uh, going to be up to it, though, Brady. <laughs> and as soon as you learn them, you might as well forget. Yeah. Well, you might know, well forget what TVAP was. I like to yeah. uh, that. That was when I didn't know you. <laughs> Sounded kind of like COVID to me. <laughs> Bring up the slide that shows the scenic yeah. easement so you can see it in relation to the ditches. You can probably just there. Sure. Um, so, oops, there it is. Um, so on the left, you can see the, the, the ditch. Um, and that area actually used to have a scenic easement over it. Um, and in 1987, that easement was vacated. And instead, it was traded for the green area that you can see in the picture on the right. So that was, um, we traded and vacated the easement that was over the existing ditches um, and acquired the easement um, over the scene at the Pearl Street Industrial Park scenic easement. Um, and the reasoning that was given for that exchange was that um, the new Pearl Street Industrial Park SE property was more visible to the public than the, the concrete channel ditches. And because it was a more natural grass lined channel than the con concrete lined ditches, and so at that time, there was a little bit more value recognized. And, and we also recognized that, um, that there may not be a whole lot of scenic or natural resource value left in this area, given the Pearl Parkway right adjacent and the, the walkway adjacent as well. 
So, so that on the right is is in the easement, the scenic easement. Correct. And is that in keeping with the easement? There's Oakland's violated the easement here. That, that... The open space real estate stuff, they monitor our, our easements, uh, you know, to some degree. So that is that's that's the is the easement that's B and that's the scenic yeah, yeah. Part, yeah. The scenic easement <laughs> language, especially back in the 1980s, and I is very nondescript. Uh, in general, I, I haven't particularly read this one, but uh, they're, they're very simplistic documents. Okay. Right. Admittedly, this is a rabbit hole, so thank you. So we have the easement, but is the ditch, is the ditch company the owner? So the ditches, they, they also have easements over the ditches, but this particular easement is just, just OSMP. But who owns the, who owns that? Oh, I don't know. Oh, is it, is it cool. Pearl Street Industrial yeah. Park? But I, I, I have to ask Bethany who owns it. I'm not sure if she's on the call, but I think it's Pearl Street Industrial Park is the business, and that's why it's hence named that uh, easement. But I, I'm not 100% certain, Dave. I'm <laughs> I was just thinking if it's the ditch company, does that provide any kind of ditch for water delivery uh, service? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So trying to give the early planners some credit, I, <laughs> I'm assuming that that ditch was not concrete lined when this decision was made initially and that it was an effort to protect the, you know, quote, riparian, you know, values associated with ditches and subsequently the ditch company in its infinite wisdom decided mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, mine the ditch, which, you know, pretty much removed all the whatever riparian or other natural values were associated with that. Um, and so I was wondering if the easement is still under a ditch company proviso that presumably that is protected under a different, um, you know, city uh, statute or permit. But if it's, if it's what you said, the industrial park or whatever it is, I'm just not, I guess I'll cut to the chase. I, I'm not overly impressed <laughs> with uh, that easement. And I guess someone should tell me uh, why open space would want to uh, continue uh, uh, managing that easement. I think we, you know, we recognize it was kind of question, questionable, but um, there, when we were looking at, we have a bunch of scenic easements. I'm not a bunch. I'm not sure how many that are kind of related to this. That are, that are similar to this in nature. Um, one reason um, we just wanted to in this process just reflect accurate current ownership it was kind of the scope of this project. Um, if we wanted to consider disposal of that, that would be a, a pretty lengthy whole nother process. The Boulder Junction Phase Two project is on a pretty tight timeline by council's direction. If we wanted to do disposal to clean up the map, that would slow that project project down. The other thought is if we were gonna take a look at the scenic easement and say, hey, what really is the value? Do we wanna consider maintaining this? Then we would maybe wanna do a kind of a comprehensive look at like, hey, how many of these scenic easements are there? And kind of do a comprehensive look and bring them all together, like at one time to the board. Um, if, that, if that became the priority to kind of look at these Kind of as a group instead of just this one and right now it was just let's just accurately reflect what what council and the board has approved um for for this boulder junction so that's the reasoning mm -hmm. right and that's a, in the other yeah. historic context Dave, as you know open space uh department's name used to be in real and real estate right. we were the real estate arm for the city for a number of years and so on these sort of orphan child projects where there was no place to put them they got put under our department's purview and so we do have, have a number of these type of things where we used to be sort of the real estate arm for the city and there was no place else to put these type of things that resulted from development projects. So. And so are we anticipating any further development? I, I don't know whether those are sidewalks or whatever that found the easement, but are we anticipating any other development in conjunction with that easement? Not that I'm aware of. Great. Uh, are there any other clarifying questions or John, are, do you want to add anything further? 
Uh, no, I, I think the important thing to keep in mind here and what I've learned is, you know, we're, we're just clarifying what's already been decided and asking council to, uh, you know, reinforce past decisions of this board and old councils that haven't been uh, accurately ref reflected in the maps. Um, so we're, we're, we're just uh, re restating what's already been stated in the past uh, by the board and council. I'm always eager to uh, reaffirm decisions that have already been made. <laughs> <laughs> Get a little history lesson in the process. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, is there any further discussion uh, from the board? Would someone like to make a oh, we have to go to a public oh, hearing? Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so, uh, this is slated for a public hearing. Uh, Sam, do we have anyone who? Has requested to come. We do. We have um, one person signed up in advance, and uh, if you would like to uh, speak, you can also raise your hand. And if you are joining by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. So the we'll start with the one person who signed up to speak, uh, Lynn Siegel, and you should be allowed uh, able to unmute yourself now. Sorry, I was in the shower. I'm just drying off. It's so hot. Um, OSO is there for a reason. Leave it alone. I don't care about this development. I don't care if, oh, it's already got an easement and we don't need it. That's what I hear from Republicans all the time. I live in Boulder. It's a progressive community in spite of the OSBT and firing Carolyn Miller, leave the OSMP alone. Leave, the, uh, leave these OSO issues alone. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, are there Thank any you. other comments? Uh, no other hands. Okay, uh, we'll return it to the board. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, would uh, someone like to make the motion? I'm going to uh, put it up on the screen in just a second. Do what? I'm going to put the motion up on the screen for yeah. y'all in just a second. John was going to. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to make the motion. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> all, all motion to recommend to planning board and city council approval of the proposed open space land use designation changes within the Boulder Junction phase two area to the Boulder Valley comprehensive plan land use map, including removal of the OSO land use designation over and adjacent to the Boulder left hand and North Boulder farmers ditches between the railroad tracks and foothills parkway north of Pearl Parkway and correcting the land use designation of the new Pearl Street Industrial Park scenic easement from light industrial to open space development rights or restrictions OSDR. Thank you, John. Is there any further discussion of the motion? No, but I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Um, Michelle? Yes. Brady? Yes. John? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the motion passes unanimous. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your presentation. It was very helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Casey. Thanks. Are there any prairie dogs there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ready to move on to the yes, next uh, item? Yes, please. So we are moving on to our fourth and final touch with the board regarding uh, the 2024 Open Space Mount Parks uh, CIP and operating budget. And uh, we are, I am going to turn things right over to Cole Moffitt, our senior accountant, who I will have support from Sam McQueen as well for this presentation. Is one second. All right, so, Dan said, my name is Cole Moffin, together with Sam Queen, we'll be presenting 
2024 CIP and operating budget. Next slide, please. So looking at this calendar, this will be the fourth and the final touch on the budget materials for this year. Uh, and the <laughs> schedule moving forward to be followed up with the planning board and city council meetings in the coming months. So we'll start tonight with an update on the budget development process, the recommended CIP and operating budget, with time at the end for clarifying questions and public comment. And lastly, we will ask for a recommendation on the 2024 CIP and operating budgets. So in a nutshell, this is what it looks like. And tonight we'll be covering all aspects of the OSMP budget, including the operating CIP, revenues and reserves, which you can reference in the fund financial, which is an attachment A in the memo. So during the June business meeting, we mentioned that revisions were being made to the CIP and operating budget due to factors such as capacity and timelines to complete projects, as well as reclassifications of a few CIP and operating projects. A list of these items can be found on table nine in the memo. And the executive budget team also known as EBT, will review our budget submittals later this month on July 24th through 26th. And the approved budget request will become part of the city manager's recommended budget. After EBT, planning board will review CIP on August 18th, followed by city council review beginning on September 14th. So we're gonna kick off tonight with the operating budget. And within the operating budget, there are four core expenditure types consisting of personnel expenditures, which we call PE, non-personnel expenditures, NPE, cost allocation, and debt service. The open space fund supports the entire operating budget, but unlike the CIP, which is also funded partly with lottery dollars. OSMP will partner with other departments on climate tax funded projects in 2024, but will not receive any direct funding. And so within the operating budget, let's talk about personnel expenditures, which make up 65% of the operating budget. And that 65% refers to salaries and benefits across employment types, such as FTE positions, as well as seasonal and temporary positions. The finance department calculates salaries and benefits for standard positions for us. However, we oversee the budgeting of our own temporary and seasonal costs. Increases for 2024 include budget requests that we shared in detail during the June business meeting. Next up is our non-personnel expenditures, which this year comprise 18% of our budget. Some examples of NPE and core service projects and programs are things like routine maintenance projects like trails, signs and fencing, equipment and material for field work, funded research, and things like training and personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE. NPE is also comprised of interdepartmental charges, such as savings mechanisms to support major purchases like technology and vehicles. And the last two pieces of the operating budget are cost allocation and debt service. So cost allocation makes up 8% of the operating budget this year. And the cost allocation plan is developed by the finance department and assigns indirect general fund costs to departments such as city attorneys, HR, IT, et cetera. Um, and typically the city updates this plan every two to three years and was last updated in 2023 with a 3% increase uh, slated in 2024. And lastly, moving into debt service, Bond payments and annual payments to the Boulder Municipal Property Authority, or BUMPA, make up 3% of our operating budget. And, our debt, and within our debt service includes a repayment of a 2014 general obligation bond and the Limpa, Lippincott BUMPA acquisition. The final BUMPA payment for EARL was made in 2023 and has been excluded from the 2024 budget. And OSMP receives 50% of the revenue of Lippincott from Jefferson County, which is factored into the 2024 budget. So next, Sam will continue with the recommended operating budget. Thanks, Cole. So turning now to the overall operating budget, OSMP is proposing $32.9 million in operating uses of funds. So this chart shows how operating dollars are spent on core services in the department. 
OSMP generally spends a comparable amount on programs and projects within the community connections and partnerships, resources and stewardship and trails and facilities service areas. In 2024, somewhat more of the operating budget will be spent on resources and stewardship and trails and facilities, which can be attributed to operationalizing ongoing work that has typically been funded in the CIP. Next slide, please. To dig into this further, the department uses a fund financial to detail revenues, expenditures, and reserves across years for the open space fund. A similar document is maintained by the finance department for the lottery fund. Here, revenues are categorized to better understand sources of funds for OSMP's operating and CIP budgets. It includes actual dollars received in 2022, the 2023 budgeted amount, and an estimate of 2024 revenues in each category. Estimates for some of these categories like sales and use tax revenue are provided to us by the finance department in their work with CU economic forecasters. These were the revenues we reviewed at the last business meeting. We use a combination of known revenue increase amounts, the consumer price index released by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics in coordination with the finance department to build assumptions for other categories. For instance, uh, in the parking revenue category, we took in about $300,000 in revenue in 2022. And based on increases in previous years, we built an assumption of a steady percentage increase to estimate revenue for parking in future years. And while we try to build in conservative assumptions, we are realistic to allow for planning of future investments in the department. Next slide, please. And this is a table of expenditures that's also included in the fund financial. Just a note here, the fund financial list budget by program instead of service area. Programs are a citywide designation and our budget is published with these titles. Since fund financials are used by departments and fund managers across the city, it's a helpful way to start comparing budgets across different functions. So the Office of the Director and Central Services are listed as administration here, and the budgeted amounts are combined in this table. In this way, the Finance Department can start to track budget for administrative functions across the city. For all other service areas, you can see that 2024 recommended dollar amounts align with the chart we presented in a previous slide. Sam, can mm -hmm. we pause? Brady, did you have a question? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt before. Yeah. Uh, what was that $13 million anomaly again in 2023? Oh, so the 20, that is our carryover. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is the money that we use year over year from CIP. So projects that have started or and are moving forward or projects that need to be um, completed. Um, it does include quite a large dollar amount, over $4 million for acquisition CIP. And so we've used the CIP to plan for our acquisitions in the past and to save for acquisitions. We are taking a look at whether this is the right approach to continue to carry over money every year. Um, and then the other piece of this is there's over a million dollars in funding for uh, Marshall Fire recovery work. So things that we anticipate to be covered by FEMA and um, insurance proceeds. Uh, we have fronted those costs and are planning to do some of that work. And so it's we carried it into this year. We had appropriated the money uh, during an ATV in 2022 and carried it into 2023. So would we see this number every year? So you again? Uh, so you'll see uh, a carryover. So you'll always see a line like this. That's sort of its own its own line like that. Yep. For the current fiscal. So for 2023 this year, next year, you'll see it in 2024. And that'll be our carryover amount. Um, we, as I mentioned, we do have a, we're making a lot of efforts to try to reduce that dollar amount. Uh, operationalizing a lot of our work is part of that process, uh, that effort to reduce the amount. But yeah, you'll see that as a, as a separate line and it's gonna be a, a just only show up in the current year. So if you looked at the full fund financial, the rest of the row would be blank through 2029. Many times we'll start a capital project in one year and it'll take another year to actually get through design, permitting, to construction. So some of that too, or projects like we've talked to the CIP, like a trail project, for example, it'll take maybe two to three years to have, you know, to actually get through implementation. So you just kind of carry that funding. That's another reason why you see some of that. Thanks for explaining that. The sky is in there, right? What's that? North Sky. Yeah, that North Sky, Gun Barrel, mm -hmm. a lot of key, like Gebhardt, a lot of key projects. Thank you. Um, and so the final piece of the fund financial is reserves. OSMP maintains 20% of the operating budget in a given year as contingency reserves for unexpected urgent needs. And that 20% amount is reflected through 2029 in the document. 
So we received guidelines from the finance department for other uh, reserve categories like pay period 27 and sick vacation and bonus reserves. Next slide, please. For a more detailed breakdown of the expenditure budget by work group, we can look at an example from the department detail page. This one page document is no longer included in the published budget, but we still use it as a department to communicate detailed budget information. This example shows the community connections and partnership service area. It's made up of six work groups, and you can see in the variance column that there's an addition of six FTE from 2023 to 2024. It reflects the conversion of six positions from temporary to standard in each of the work groups where they are listed. Overall, the $6.5 million budget in 2024 for the service area ties to the amount on the fund financial. Next slide, please. And the last big piece of the draft 2024 budget, operating budget is staffing levels by service area. And as Cole mentioned, OSMP supports standard full-time equivalent or FTE employees, temporary employees, and seasonal employees. And one FTE is modeled at 2,080 hours per year. Temporary and seasonal employee numbers are shown here as an accounting of how many employees are expected to be hired in the department, not as FTE. So the 146.6 FTE listed here account for the addition of some FTE and conversion of temporary positions to standard FTE as presented at the June business meeting. The column for seasonal and temporary employees also includes the new positions presented at that meeting. The department detail page included in this month's packet details additions of FTE by service area and work group. Next slide, please. And finally, we'll close with a look at the 2024 operating and CIP budget together. The operating budget, which includes service area budgets, cost allocation, and debt payments, makes up 83% of the budget. The CIP makes up the remainder of the budget. You can see here that it's, a, it's supported by both the open space and lottery funds. Next slide. To close, uh, ahead of public comment, does the OSP have any clarifying questions regarding the department's recommended budget? Great, thank you. Um, so uh, under the, in the staffing and expenditure by program, it says in the recommended budget, there's an FTE amount and then there's a total amount. The total amount includes the temp and seasonals? So the totals, so the, if you're looking and you're looking at the memo over, not, okay. yes. So you're attachment B. Attachment B. Um, attachment B is the department detail page, and that uh, is only FTE, so that does not include seasonal and temporary. So when we have a variance of one FTE and the variance amount is 419,000, presumably some other people are getting raises. It's not just that they're going to, that's the full. So the yes, full that's. For that one FTE, I doubt it. No, so the uh, additional costs you see are, um, so Cole mentioned that the finance department models our standard positions for us. They model them in a similar way to how we model our seasonal and temporary. So they build in assumptions for merit increases each year. Um, they build in assumptions for benefit changes um, and they build in assumptions for, for any kind of, uh, any other, I mentioned benefits. So any other benefits that, that would normally be accounted for. Uh, and typically these increase year over year. So you'll see an increase for the right. It just seemed part. like the variance was in a function of FTE increases, not just. Let's see. Sorry, if this is, if this is too. No, and I apologize. Let me just get this up uh, on my. If you look at agricultural oh. management, there's right. one FTE extra and there's a 419,000. It's the prairie dog. Maybe. I know. So maybe we have to pay them that much because they're the. Uh, let me just make sure I'm, I'm referring to the same columns as, as you are looking at. So if we're looking, can you, can you uh, say which ones you're looking at one more time? I'm looking at resources and stewardship, agricultural yep. management, variance 23 to 24, one FTE, uh, $419,000. Yeah, I'm, you know, thank you. Sorry I'm about that. that. An example of like, you know, what's clearly, I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I apologize for that. I wasn't thinking of the last column there. Um, so now I'm looking at the same document you're looking at. So the, there is one addition of one FTE. The one FTE w is not 419,000. Yep. Uh, that is any increases to uh, staffing costs that's baked into the 419,000, but it's uh, also any additions that we've made to the program. So the agricultural management program, for instance, we've made additions to temporary staffing. Uh, these temps do reflect in the total dollar amount. Yep. Uh, so, okay. 
addition of capital to operating to? That is only on the operating side. Yeah. And so, um, so in our previous, uh, at the June meeting, the budget additions that we had shared um, included those budget requests, we call them budget requests, so any additions to the budget, and those are reflected in that number as well. Okay, they're just highly variable as a function of FTE, and so there's obviously more going on than that. Than sort of yeah, it's, that. I think there's, and Colt, did you wanna, sorry. I was just gonna say to you, yeah, the ag program specifically, we took um, annual fencing maintenance and took it out of CIP and put it into operating, so that, is about, I think, 112,000 of that 419 that so you'll be tempers or seasonal labor that we have to hire to do those things. No, that was a non personnel. Yeah. Oh, that's not, so we're looking at non it's not personnel numbers. In there. Yeah, there's, it's a mix of all of the operating costs. So it would be non personnel, personnel, so standard and non standard FTE are included in the dollar amounts. The FTE, and so I did mention, you know, we, we kept this at, because we thought the, the one pager was a helpful tool. So the city really used this uh, as a function to show, you know, FTE increases and decreases, and we sort of kept that. And it's, I'm wondering now, as we're talking through, if we should also reflect um, uh, non-standard positions in this uh, as we are looking at future years going forward, um, because that was, you know, it's not just uh, the FTEs that are accounting for all of that. It's all the operating monies to go to support that particular work group or program area. It is uh, yep. slightly confusing to yeah. yeah. bag of money. Even though we have a yeah. specific column just to let you know what the yeah. FTE count is, the total amount dollar shown is the program. Okay. Dollar amounts allotted for that. Effort. Take some of these offline again. I need everyone. No, no, that's no, good. good. Okay, yeah. it's fine. It's good. I, I, obviously, I was out meeting with people. We're going to talk about <laughs> prairie dogs and ag, and I'm just wondering. Okay, if hypothetically we wanted to put more resources into ag or anything else as a midstream correction, how much flexibility do you all have? And that's when you do the. I forget what you call it. You have to recalculate the budget. You actually have quite a bit of management flexibility within these numbers to change things as you see needed. Not on the FTE, but yeah, the FTE the is definitely FTE is solid. But other than that, there is you all have a fair amount of flexibility to to, to adapt to management practices to your own staffing, basically, or, or to the, how does that work? Well, for instance, like we have our agricultural ecology program area, which was just established what, in 2020 mm -hmm. on the heels of all the prairie dog work, we establish a separate program area within this line item to work on restoring our agricultural lands. Um, uh, we, uh, do we, every year we could use budget monies to say how many temporary staff, do we need more temporary staff to, to fund that program? Which properties should they hit? Um, should we, uh, where should the emphasis be for that? Those are the flexibilities we have uh, within, you know, within our own department within a budget year. If we want to say we need four more Eric Fairleys on a permanent basis to lead that department, and that gets into the That's, type of that would be a part of the 2025 process. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Michelle, oh, yeah, great. thank you. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. Okay, Michelle. Uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> speaking of clear of um, staffing, um, I know that this column um, under Table Six. Um, that seasonal and temporary employees, that's that's a complicated number because it's the number of positions. Do you all internally try to do a conversion to FTE? So if somebody were wanting to know what order of magnitude, how, how have the resources increased or decreased over time by program area? I know that's further complicated by the use of contractors. But I'm just wondering if, if we wanted to get sort of a sense for, and I know that like the Junior Rangers one is a, is a difficult one because it's 130 positions, but you could actually calculate that, right? Mm -hmm. The number of approved hours and the number of days and yeah, and, and how that program has grown over time. Because I've seen that, um, what's nice to see that the, the Junior Ranger program um, has increased over time. And I just don't know how we, sort of draw conclusions of the trends over time. You know, if, if you did any trends yeah. trying to, attempting to convert those to an FTE. Yeah, so that is, um, that's an interesting question too. In our, the previous iterations of the budget book, uh, it, it was actually done citywide. 
And so there was a table that included uh, for every department conversion of uh, seasonal and temporary hours into FTE. Um, we as a department haven't haven't shared that, but we can certainly calculate that and start to share that to uh, to look over time. We mostly have been just tracking by headcount and number of hours, which translate into the the budget hours for us. Um, but it's not something that we're unable to do. So we can we can look into that for sure. For instance, if there's a specific program area that you all are interested in and you want to have a conversation about uh, at the retreat, for instance, like we want to kind of get weird and have some input into next year's budgeting process. You know, we, we've done that exercise this past year with wildfire resilience and forestry. You know, where were we? Oh, we were at four staff people, and then we moved to eight, and we moved to 10, we need to be at 13. So we look at that trend data when we have a specific area that we're looking at, certainly. So if there's a program area that you all are interested in and looking at where our capacity is, we could certainly pull trends up over the years and show you where the investments have been and what we're able to do with that additional capacity that we've added. So, um, I mean, a little late in the game right now hey, for this night, that. but perfect retreat conversation, for instance, if there's some program areas you want us sort of dig into and look at capacity, those are numbers we can pull together, certainly. Great. You, any other questions, Michelle? Uh, John, do you have any questions? No questions for me. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a couple. Uh, and Cole, I, you got to know that I, I'm not a big fan of cost allocation. I, I find it to be a pretty squishy uh, concept and number. So how is it specifically calculated at this point? Do we just get a percentage from the finance office or do we actually have uh, more concrete data with which to determine uh, a cost allocation number. Sure, I can start. And, yeah. Uh, in these off cycle years, yes, they just give us a 3% number, whatever percent that is um, before they update it. And that's just kind of what we have to go with. On the years that they do um, change it, they give us a chance to look at everything and we go through the cost drivers. We look at different things like, does this number look off does it look high based on what we do internally and we send back a bunch of feedback of like hey you know maybe we think we're getting charged too much for this area because we handle that service more of ourselves type thing and we give feedback to that i know when the plan was last getting updated i believe it was 21 in uh post covid um and sam maybe you can help me with this one but i think a lot of our feedback was listen to but not fully incorporated in that way so it just kind of depends on the year but in this year yeah it's about it's a three percent mark up of previous cost drivers so for instance uh in the years that we're looking at it more specifically in 2025 hmm. um would we get uh hours from the city attorney's office or from it with which then we could make those determinations or are they estimates or are they actual hours that have been uh, recorded? There, there are, and do you mind if I jump in, jump in if I get any of this um, wrong? The, um, they are actual hours. Uh, so when they update the plan, they do it based off of number of hours. So a consultant will work with uh, the individual departments okay. to get those hours. Um, in the years where the plans are updated, that's when we really give most of our feedback. And so that would be a case. So if you're talking about number of hours uh, of service performed, that's a case where we would give feedback and say, well, actually, we think it was this number of hours. Um, in the last plan that was updated in 2023, for example, I think there were a handful of software licenses on there, and they included all of our staff. And many of our staff members didn't have that license. So we went back and gave them the number that we had recorded for how many people we knew, and they took that feedback and, and updated it. When they update, when they gave us the three percent increase for this year, uh, that that doesn't that back and forth doesn't happen as much because they're just using the old plan as the base. Um, the three percent increase, as Cole mentioned, is more to account for uh, cost of input. So if there are any kind of supplies or software costs on there that increase year over year, also cost of staff, staff salaries in the case of when we're being charged for hourly. Uh, types of work. Great. Thanks. And my other question is uh, somewhat tangential, but 
Um, and this is kind of a head scratcher. And I talked to Lauren about it, and she said you were going to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know why there's a parenthetical uh, in Table Four after administration that says environmentally sustainable. Yeah. I think that, is, from my perspective, that's a complete oxymoron. <laughs> but um, I'm willing to hear kind of what what uh, provoked us to do that. Yeah, so that is actually um, uh, in here, that table describes the, the program designation from the city. And so that's where we are, you know, we do have, so some of our programs like resources and stewardship and trails and facilities, they don't necessarily align with others in the city. If they did, they would probably keep those same names. So, so they, they are called just resources and stewardship and trails and facilities on the program level. For some of our other work like work of central services and the work of our office of the director um, that have more of an administrative function, there is really a desire to start tracking that across the city. Um, and so we've called that administration and there's an administration program in many of the departments across the city that will allow the city to start tracking uh, those costs across the entire, all of the departments. Um, the, what you saw in parentheses, environmentally sustainable, that's our sustainability and resilience framework designation. So um, we, there are a handful of categories that are included in the city's sustainability and resilience framework. Uh, and I, the parentheses there are, are also a designation that we receive that says that uh, the work of this administrative program is focused on that en uh, environmentally sustainable category. Um, and so there could be others in the city that also have that designation. Um, I'm not quite sure if they're using that part of the category to start tracking. This is new for us. This is a new thing that we're doing with, um, and so it's, uh, I'm interested to see, you know, we'll learn with the finance department, uh, department and start to partner with them to understand what the parentheses part of it is going to do for us and what we're going to uh, be able to track from there. But for now, the administration part is the, is the piece that I think that we're really starting to track across the city. So do we know other nomenclatures for administration that are being used? Yeah, so uh, I couldn't give you an example off the top of my head um, from, from other departments, uh, but we do have, uh, there are other SCR framework categories and they'll, and I can pull, um, I've got them open, I'm just. So Sam, you're saying that there's, there's environmentally sustainable citywide costs in there that are not necessarily administrative and so it's a, is that because because Dave's asking is if that's a if if, if that's another word for administration? Right. And, but what I'm hearing you say is there's other costs that are in that category. Yeah. So um. And so why isn't it a, dep it a departmental uh, descriptor ra rather than administration? It just strikes me as weird. It, I, and it's still something, like I said, that we're partnering to learn a little bit more about. We do try to lay, so just as an example, so the SER, the goals that are listed, so we have, there could be administration environmentally sustainable, there could be administration accessible and connected is another one of those goals. Um, it is, we are still learning how, how that's going to be tied. We, we're tracking the overall administration cost and then laying the SER goal on top of it and saying that, hey, are these administration costs most closely align with the sustainability and resilience framework goal. Okay. We have more to learn. We do have more to learn there. It's a new system. Also, the other things that we may be revisiting in subsequent years is what I mentioned the word program areas, which we think of as our agricultural program. From the citywide perspective, there's just four program, four or yeah, four program areas right. of ours that the city recognizes, and so we are with this new way of incorporating the enterprise level budget. We may be looking at what we want to have defined as a program area at the citywide level, and we may recommend some changes to that. But right now, we have just gone with our service areas as our, what the city is calling our program areas, even though we all know that the director, office of the director and central services, they do a lot more than just administration. I mean, we support all the service areas. So we're involved in helping out our agricultural program, our forestry program, but it's, it's not being captured at that level of detail uh, at the citywide level. So 
it is it is brand new this this new budgeting uh, framework that we're striving for as a citywide and and we're a bit of an odd peg in this <laughs> and we're trying to fit in the best we can and it could look different even next year of how we're describing some of these things. Uh, we'll look forward to that. Uh, so in the risk of uh, going from the sublime to the ridiculous, which I think uh, I just did, um, are there any other clarifying questions or are we ready to go to public comment? Uh, let us do that then. Um, so we currently don't have anyone signed up for public comment. Uh, if you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand by using the icon at the bottom of your screen or clicking on the participants box. And if you are joining by phone, you can press star nine. And are we seeing none? Uh, one hand now. Okay. Get the Zoom timer. Okay. So we're just going to grab the timer, and then uh, we have one hand uh, from Lynn Siegel. And you should be able to unmute yourself now. Lynn, we're hoping you're out of the shower and uh, ready to speak to us. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess it's interesting that no one wants to talk about open space budget, you know, about the funding that goes into our open space in the city. It's fascinating to me. There's only me, you know, and I'm an ultrasound technologist. I'm in the life sciences, but you know, I can tell you from the 30,000 foot view, we've got a huge deficit. We've got increasing costs all the time. And then you fire Caroline Miller when she tells you what's really going on is a secret conversation made to Hal Halstein talking about what can we do to facilitate the the CU acquisition of the open space. What what kind of a multiplier do we need? What's the bottom line here? What Lynn, if you'd like to uh, focus your comments on the budget? Uh, yep, that's what, what that's exactly it. what I'm talking about, Dave. I'm talking about how you make your budget when you've got a whole nother city campus coming to Boulder, and how are you going to deal with that? You know, you can't, you know, we're, our budget is over, you know, we're, we're overextended as it is. And yet when there's a discussion about how CU's going to get another third to a half of this town, which they did with the annexation project, and it's revealed by Caroline Miller, that's a problem. For OSBT. Three years ago, you could have done something. You know, on November 9th, you could have done something. Nothing happened. And these are very affecting to your bottom line, to your budget. Because the city of Boulder has use. And the more use, the more maintenance, and the more maintenance and operations the more money, and it's my tax dollars that are being spent. So yes, Dave, it's all about CU South because that's the bigger view of what's really happening here. And Burke, same thing. You know, what are you doing about the big picture? You're not. You're fiddling with the details. And Thank it's you, all Lynn. integrated. Appreciate your comments. I'm not done. I've got 10 seconds left. My lousy three minutes staring at, a, at numbers instead of you. I want to see you, please. Done. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I'm not seeing any other hands. Great. Uh, we'll bring this back to the board for any further discussion. Yeah, I just have a quick question, um, Sam. There, there was mention about a, a deficit. Can you please address that comment? I'm not seeing any deficits in, in any of the last four meetings of materials that you've provided. Yeah, that we've gone through extensively. 
over the last four months. Can you speak to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we uh, manage the Open Space Fund and, and OSMP. And so most of the documents you've seen are tied to the Open Space Fund. Um, we very closely tie our budget to our sales and use tax projections because that makes up over 90% of our revenue sources. Um, and so we don't have a deficit in the way that we've built the budget for the next six years through 2029. Um, we always try to have a, a general fund balance uh, at the end of a six year period between one to $2 million, which is what you see in the fund financial. Um, if we do get into a deficit situation, which we haven't in the last uh, couple years, last several years, um, we would dip into fund balance if we absolutely had to, but it's not in our plans for the next six years because of our, our reserve policies and the way that we've built out our fund financial. Yeah, I think, yeah, there is some confusion uh, on, on the notion of deficit. And I, uh, Sam, I think your explanation was very good and, and helpful. Um, but my, I'm also thinking that it, people are seeing that our uh, discussion of the trail maintenance backlog, for example, is, is there's a, you know, $40 million or what, whatever the number is um, need that's out there that we still have not budgeted for. And in uh, some people's minds that that's a, you know, a deficit that we're carrying um, into the future. And from my perspective, um, each annual budget uh, deals with that incrementally. Um, and so, uh, I think that we are addressing that, and we obviously won't do it in one fell swoop, but we we do do it on an annual basis, and sometimes it's higher and sometimes it's not so high. But in any event, I think that is out in front of a lot of us that you know we're paying attention to that as well. I, I kind of view that sort of subject as 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 good asset management as opposed to a budget item. Uh, we have we're responsible for a suite of asset classes, whether it's trails, trailheads, irrigation infrastructure, fencing. And what we charge our project managers to do is tell us what you view your maintenance, what the maintenance needs are over a six or a ten year period for your asset class that you're responsible. And if you're if you do good responsible asset management, you would know what type of maintenance you want to put into your asset classes. So yes, there's always going to be a projected need. For every asset class, whether it's trails or trailheads, is you need to keep it up to date. Sometimes you need to do a significant repair. Sometimes you want to construct something new, and that's just good asset management to sort of know, to be able to project ahead, to know where your needs are, and to do a rough estimate of what you think those costs are. So then, when you do your annual budgeting, you can go to work at various pieces right. of that. All right. Okay. Uh, seeing uh, no further uh, questions or comments, um, I will entertain a motion to adopt the budget, well, to recommend to the City Council um, the, uh, the budget proposed for 2024. And I'm looking for the motion. I'll try that. Do you have that? Uh, and I... Uh Oh, yes. Thank you, Megan. I apologize. Um, we do have a change to the motion, a uh, slight change to the motion language um, on the first motion listed for the CIP. Uh, this is just for a recommendation. Um, and the, the version that is in the memo includes the word approve. Um, so this version uh, on the screen is the corrected version. So do we have... Uh... All right. Um, well, is there been a second? Is there a second? The the, motion? We don't have a first yet. We don't have the motion up. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'll try that. All right. <laughs> I'll, Go. I'll move the open space board of trustees to recommend that planning board and city council approve an appropriation of $6,225,209 in 2024 from the open space fund CIP as outlined in the memorandum and recommend that $428,000 be appropriated from the city's lottery fund CIP in 2024. That, that's one motion, right? Okay, so that needs a second. 
Do we have a second? I'll second. Uh, let us, do we need to separate these or can we take the, make the, approve the motion, uh, motions? Uh, they are two separate motions. So we'll do so, that. Yeah, the second we'll one. one each, yeah. uh, so I'll do a roll call on this one, uh, Michelle? Yes. Brady? Yes. John? Yes. And I vote yes as well, so it passes unanimously. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Michelle, will you do the second? Hand. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move the Open Space Board of Trustees to recommend that City Council approve an appropriation of $32,924,715 in 2024 for the Open Space and Mountain Parks operating budget from the Open Space Fund as outlined in this memorandum and related attachments. And I will second that as well. We'll do a roll call on this one, uh, Michelle. Yes. Katie? Yes. John? Yes. And I have all guests as well, so it passes unanimously. Thanks, Sam and Cole. We appreciate nice it. Uh, <laughs> it was very helpful. And I think this, in my experience, has been one of the more informative and um, expeditious uh, budget uh, processes that uh, I've been involved in. So thanks a lot for that. I do like doing them together. Yes, so thank you indeed. for getting to the, getting us that point. Thank you. And just uh, looking back a year ago, thank you for all the CIP suggestions of helping us determine what is appropriately in the CIP versus operating. That was one of our big lists this year. Great. So I think it worked well. Thanks. Uh, so do we want to take a quick I think this short... might be the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let us do that. Uh, can we do a five minute break, which will get us back here at you know, about 8.41 or 2, 8.42? 7.42. 7. <laughs> We're doing better than you think. So Dan, I think we are ready for the third public hearing item, Prairie Dogs. Yeah, and this is, I believe, month three of providing you information on the staff's evaluation, internal evaluation of the 2020 uh, uh, guidance that we received from City Council on uh, uh, reducing conflict uh, between prairie dogs and irrigated agricultural lands. Um, as you all know, we've been on about a five month internal process to kind of look at what's working well, what's not, and to suggest a few refinements to the uh, overall policy guidance that we received in 2020. Um, I do want to note offhand that be, when I turn things over to Heather, that I, uh, Heather and I did speak uh, a week or two ago about adding some additional upfront slides that might be helpful for this board, just because the foundation of our management rests on so much, you know, really policies dating back to 20, 2005 that's still in place. Uh, through various agricultural plans and grasslands plans. And so Heather's going to spend just about three or four additional minutes up front to just give you a sense of everything that is resting on um, on our work at, in regards to prairie dogs and, and what sort of piece we're looking at tonight. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Heather Swanson, our interim director of resources and stewardship. Great. Thanks, Deputy Dan. director. <laughs> Uh, so as Dan said, and we can go ahead uh, to the next slide, I'm going to be joined tonight by Tori Poulton. So I'll, I'm going to give some of the background and then we'll hand things over to her. Um, but it, as Dan said, um, conversations around prairie dog management in the city of Boulder and on open space and mountain parks have been ongoing for many decades. And our current policies and plans um, go back quite a ways. And, and since those since those previous conversations, there have been various steps in the city and open spaces process of evaluating how to best address prairie dog management, prairie dog conservation, greater grassland conservation, and um, those types of topics. So the kind of our current foundation for our prairie dog management starts in 2000 when the city passed a wildlife protection ordinance, which prohibited lethal control of prairie dogs um, in the city of Boulder and on city properties. And during that time frame, um, it was after a plague episodic, and there was rapid growth of colonies on private and public lands. 
and also during that time when development um, occurred, those prairie dogs were relocated to open space and mountain parks. So there was a extensive relocations to OSMP at the time. In 2005, um, that ordinance was amended to actually make it consistent with state law. And that um, allowed for limited circumstances under which lethal control was allowed within the city and on city properties through the use of a special permit for lethal control. Um, but at the time, through those community conversations around the um, management of open space specifically, um, the community was, was strong in their feeling that lethal control um, did not have a place on open space. So it, although it was, although there was a legal path for special permits, um, it was not used for open space purposes. Um, in 2005 through 2008, uh, Sylvatic Plague moved through the open space land system. And so we saw a very dramatic drop in prairie dog populations at the time, um, which was a, a good opportunity on our agricultural properties to do some restoration. That unfortunately um, also lined up with the um, the recession at the time and associated budget and staff reductions, which somewhat limited our ability to identify new and additional funding and capacity to respond to that. So um, there was some um, restoration done, but not as much as we would hope to be in a position to do. We found ourselves in that position again. Um, and if that were to happen, we now have our agroecology program and um, you know fairly robust prairie dog related budget that could be redirected at that point for restoration post plague. Um, then in 2010, the uh, department completed the grassland ecosystem management plan that really looked at uh, grassland conservation overall and put prairie dog management in the context of that overall grassland conservation plan. Um, and at the time, though, although prairie dogs were only one component of the grassland plan, a lot of the community and decision maker conversation focused around prairie dog management and conservation. And at the time, the community conservation, the community conversation focused very heavily on prairie dog conservation. Um, and the amendments that council asked staff to make to the plan were to increase the areas that um, were available to conserve prairie dogs on open space and mountain parks. And at the time, um, there was there was fairly robust conversation around neighbor conflict, um, but the grassland plan did not identify any specific strategies to address um, neighbor conflicts. And so staff continued to support neighbors um, in managing prairie dogs on their own property. Next slide. Um, in 2016, um, the community and city council um, entered into a conversation around the removal of prey dogs at a private property called um, the Armory around um, the, the development of that property. Um, the, the developer was um, seeking a special permit for lethal control and the, the community felt very strongly that that was not um, desirable. So city council gave open space and Mount parks direction to accept prairie dogs from the armory. This was the first time that open space had taken prairie dogs from private property for development since that um, ordinance was passed in 2000. And I'm sorry, since the, the new ordinance was passed in 2005. Um, and so, uh, Open Space and Mount Parks did take prairie dogs from the Armory property over two years of relocation um, to the Southern Grasslands. And at the time, um, City Council then also directed staff because of the level of community interest and conversation and disagreement over prairie dog management that came to light as part of the Armory conversation to create the Prairie Dog Working Group to, ex to examine city prairie dog management um, on all city properties, not just on Open Space and Mount Parks. Um, at the same time, the agricultural management plan was completed in 2017, um, and it set out um, goals for agriculture on OSMP. Agriculture had been included in the grassland ecosystem management plan, um, but this really put a, a spotlight on the agricultural program and came up with some very specific goals and objectives for those uh, uses of our property. And that included um, pretty broad and extensive engagement with the agricultural community and lessees um, on open space lands. And like I said, sort of running a parallel with that was the Prairie Dog Working Group. Their recommendation, their final recommendations went to City Council in at the end of 2018. Um, and that Prairie Dog Working Group included members of the community, including um, OSMP and Parks and Rec neighbors, Prairie Dog Conservation Advocates, agricultural producers, and ecologists. And that group came up with a robust list of recommendations for Prairie Dog management, um, including some strategies for neighbor relations, um, like establishing a cost share grant program Program, which is currently in development by staff. And then in 2020, um, there was, in, well, actually in 2019, there was intense interest in um, the fact that the Prairie Dog Working Group had not provided a lot of recommendations around 
um, mitigating conflict between prairie dogs and agriculture on open space and mountain parks. And so um, staff, the community and the board undertook the conversation, which we're currently focusing on to um, look at how that conflict could be better addressed, um, particularly on irrigated agricultural properties. Next slide. So while we've had all of these prairie dog conversations, um, this has laid a foundation of robust policy guidance, um, a large stack of plans related to prairie dog management and conservation. And so there's a lot of ongoing work um, that, that staff undertakes every year, um, sometimes many times a year, uh, based on the guidance that we've gotten in, in these uh, policy and plan documents. Um, so as far as prairie dog conservation is concerned, this is things like monitoring and mapping annually of prairie dogs, monitoring of associated species, um, plague management, which, which came out of the Prairie Dog Working Group and a plague management plan that was completed for that. Collaboration with partner agencies around prairie dog management, um, including those that have adjacent lands somewhat continuous to our um, grassland ecosystems, uh, Boulder County, Jefferson County, Rocky Flats Wildlife Refuge. Um, the annual meeting that we hold for neighbors, lessees, and anybody in the community to uh, collect feedback, share the current status of our management and prairie dog populations and our plans for upcoming management, and coexistence experimentation, um, which was included in the 2020 conversations as a collaborative learning group, um, which is an ongoing process uh, between a variety of community members to undertake um, restoration and agricultural work on uh, a parcel that has prairie dogs on it to investigate uh, what strategies might work in those contexts. Next. And then we have a lot of ongoing work around neighbor collaboration based on the conversations that um, have happened over the years with the community and, and some of the guidance in the prairie dog working group recommendations. Um, and so this includes communication with neighbors around their property management. Um, this is something that happens year round um, with a variety of neighbors, often includes, it's usually Tory, although if it's next to an agricultural property, sometimes our agricultural staff get involved in site visits, talking about technical information and suggestions with neighbors, helping them interpret regulations, um, both at the city, county or state level. Um, helping them with site-specific planning um, because topography factors a lot into the best way to manage prey dogs on a specific site. So that may be suggestions around barrier installation, vegetation management, um, and what removal methods are available to them. And in some cases, um, additional support is possible, like allowing them to attach their barrier to an OSMP fence line, which decreases their costs. And again, th those are all very site-specific and just tailored to the the conditions that each individual neighbor is experiencing. Um, and then we do have um, a lot of communication with neighbors around management on the adjacent open space land. So that often includes site visits um, and talking with them about whether there are potential modifications to grazing or weed management or irrigation. In many cases, if it's a property that has a, a, an agricultural lease on it, those conversations um, include the lessee because they often are the ones responsible for those types of management on the properties. And uh, Tori and I are working to develop and roll out a neighbor cost share program for, for barrier installation um, that was called out in the, the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations. Next slide. There's also a lot of ongoing work related to water and water infrastructure. Um, our Water Rights Administration um, program is quite busy with delivery of water, uh, participation and leadership on ditch boards, maintenance of existing ditches and infrastructure, um, and then working on larger scale water infrastructure replacement and repair projects. And that, that's really um, a year round ongoing program um, with obviously focal times for water delivery uh, during the water season. Next slide. And then our agricultural program has a lot of ongoing work, of course. Um, weed management, which is done not only by our agricultural staff, but also by our vegetation management staff. So that can be accomplished through mowing or hand pulling, chemical control on agricultural properties. Lots of times that is accomplished by our lessees in collaboration with staff. Um, prairie dog removals are ongoing, both relocation and lethal control. Barrier installation and maintenance is occurring um, throughout the year. Restoration of unleased lands. 
um, some of which have prairie dogs, some of which don't. So that's things like tilling, key line plowing, administering water, seeding, planting, composting, and other um, restoration techniques. Uh, soil health monitoring system-wide um, is ongoing with our relatively new soil health program led by Lauren Kolb. Um, and that's both system-wide monitoring as well as plots that are designed on prairie dog removal areas and through the restoration project process after removal. And then agricultural lease administration is, is ongoing. So development of leases, renewing of leases, agricultural planning, supporting lessees, ongoing collaboration with those lessees, and then e ecological integration with agriculture. Um, and so the creation of stewardship plans for leased lands, um, coordination of haying schedules with nesting birds, fencing ponds and riparian areas, collaboration with lessees, and then collaboration between staff um, on the ag side as well as the ecological side. Next slide. And so tonight we're looking at a, a relatively small piece of the overall prairie dog management and conservation puzzle. Um, so our recommendations, although they do address a number of things, they, they don't address the vast majority of the plans and policies that we have in place regarding prairie dog management and conservation. So things like the charter, the master plan, that wildlife protection ordinance from 2005, um, and then some of our prairie dog plans like the Grassland Ecosystem Management Plan and the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations. Um, certainly this work stems from the Agricultural Management Plan, but we're not talking about any specific modifications to that plan. Um, and we're, we really aren't dipping into our prairie dog conservation goals um, or our, our management of non-irrigated agricultural lands and native grasslands. So what we are looking at though, is those areas where we're seeking to reduce conflict between prairie dogs and irrigated agricultural use on OSMB land. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and so we've made a lot of progress since 2020. Um, we have done 159 acres of relocation since 2020, and this does include the acres that will have been completed this year in 2023. So these will be totals after this removal season. We will have completed 314 acres of lethal control, and that's actually from 21 to 23. Um, we didn't talk with city, we didn't get final city council direction until um, I believe it was September of 2020. And so the program didn't actually begin until 21. Um, of those acres, 72 acres have been fully restored by staff. Additional acres have been restored by lessees if those were on already leased properties. 92 acres are in the, in the process of being restored. Um, and after the 2023 removal season, that will result in a near, nearly 50% reduction in the conflict um, over what we were seeing in 2020. And that also has resulted in removal of prairie dogs um, from property, from open space properties directly adjacent to approximately um, 95 private landowners and neighbors. Next slide. So just a quick process review. Obviously, we've been talking with you over the last several months. So um, you've heard a lot of this several times. And so I apologize for that. Um, we discussed that we were going to be doing this evaluation at our annual public meeting last December. Um, we provided background on the current management in our May memo to the Open Space Board, and then information on the analysis and potential modifications in our June memo, so last month. And then a notification email was sent out to interested constituents on June 9th and was posted online on June 14th. And then tonight we have a public hearing um, with a full memo and um, hopefully resulting in a board recommendation at the end of the night. So why are we reevaluating now? Why are we bothering to do this? A lot of these changes actually exist within the framework of implementation within the direction that we've received from city council, not all of it, but um, why are we looking at all of this? And really it just comes down to um, a commitment by the department and by staff to um, complete this program in the best way possible to have the most success. So it, we're, it's really being done because we have a commitment to adaptive management. We've learned some lessons over the last three years. We've learned what works well, what may not work quite as well and what, um, what we might do differently. Um, it, that's really based on the commitment to support irrigated agriculture on um, OSMP lands and, and a hope to enhance the program to reduce prairie dog conflict on irrigated agricultural lands and restore those lands to irrigated agricultural production. It's also about a commitment to use open space and city resources in the most responsible and transparent way possible. 
and to enhance our efficiency and efficacy, um, which should lead to additional success in our implementation. Um, a commitment to remove prairie dogs when conditions and resources allow for restoration to irrigated agriculture and exclusion of prairie dogs after removal. A commitment to transparency um, and being clear with the public and the board about how we're making decisions around removal and restoration and what information is being considered by staff in that process. And, and a commitment to address the complexity of our landscape and conditions um, that vary across properties and some of the complexity that comes out of that imbalance of multiple open space purposes. Next slide. As a lot of the program has worked quite well and we're not recommending any modifications to it. Um, we're, not, we're not suggesting that the focus will shift off of irrigated agricultural lands on OSMP. Um, we're not suggesting a um, change to the scale of annual removals. Um, we found that that scale is, um, although doable is um, aggressive. Um, so we're, we're not suggesting a, a different scale for that. Um, using a use of barriers to continue to protect removal areas, which functions to reduce ongoing lethal control, which is consistent with the, the city's wildlife protection ordinance and priorities around that. Um, the, the use of the prioritization factors that were in, discussed with the board and city council in 2020 to be the selection criteria um, for which properties to manage in each year. Um, continuing to investigate um, and implement coexistence and restoration measures in the presence of prairie dogs on both leased and unleased lands to continue to learn what, what does and doesn't work within that, that framework. Um, to continue to present all planned management to the community and collect feed public feedback in December prior to finalizing plans for the year, and to present those management plans to the Open Space Board in January and February, and then following up with an IP to City Council. Next slide. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Tori. Um, for several of the recommendations, we're just going to, to read them so that everybody knows exactly what the recommendation says. Some of them we've got a little bit more clarifying information about, so she's gonna just quickly go through those. Um, so, Tori, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so, yes, I'm Tori Portland, the prairie dog ecologist with OSMP. Um, so, yeah, moving into our recommended modifications, these are based on lessons we've learned over the last three years of implementing um, and trying to reduce prairie dog conflict on irrigated agricultural lands. And we expect these modifications will help to make our program more efficient. Um, first off, item A. Um, we're pro proposing an evaluation system that describes properties based on individual characteristics, the challenges and opportunities that they present. Um, and that's not only for prey dog removal, but also erecting barriers, uh, restoration, and then any other ecological issues that may be present. This evaluation system is meant to be used in support of the prioritization criteria that are initially um, identified and used in the, the, um, the city council recommendations from 2020. Um, it's not intended to replace or supersede those priorities. They will remain in place. Um, rather, this system will organize information. Uh, so it's available across work groups and on a site-by-site -site basis. So it's gonna allow better tracking and communication about conditions on these properties that affect our management decisions. Um, this evaluation system, it's important to point out that it's descriptive, so it's not going to dictate any management actions, and property conditions are likely to change over time due to our management actions or other factors, so the evaluation system is meant to track that. Um, and prey dog removals may happen from any category within the system, and we'll talk about the categories in the next slide. Uh, and that goes back to those prioritization criteria identified in 2020 and other factors that are uh, related to likelihood of success or removal um, and based on available resources. So ultimately, this doesn't really represent any change from what we've been doing. And the next slide. The slide shows the table of the four different groups that we've identified. Um, these, are, again, are based on conditions on individual properties and how that contributes to prairie dog removal and the restoration process. This ranges from the Group A properties that are considered ready to go and don't need any um, additional modifications prior to removal of prairie dogs and restoration. Goes through Group 
B and C properties that have increasing needs for investment of effort and resources to return them to agricultural production uh, beyond just prey dog removal. Um, and or these properties may have ecological values that would be affected by prey dog removal, or there might be other difficulties related to the landscape, such as the ability to put up effective barriers. Um, the most challenging of the Group D properties where there's conditions where restoration of irrigated agriculture is really unlikely in the near future. In some cases, these conditions for the Group D properties might be permanent and may make the property a can candidate for a change in management designation. But for most of these properties, we, accept, we expect that these conditions can change once needs for things like irrigation infrastructure are met. Um, or a plague moves through the area and changes the prey dog landscape and makes restoration easier, uh, or a sensitive species occupation in the area changes. And I do want to emphasize for this table of, of grouping of properties, we do already use this information um, within this evaluation system for our management process and decision making. This system itself is a new way to improve communication among staff and make the, avail the information available and transparent to the Open Space Board and the community. Next slide. Moving on with additional recommendations, item B um, would be to uh, expand the geographic scope of this init the uh, initial project um, to reduce prey dog conflict on irrig irrigable agricultural lands. This would expand it beyond the originally identified northern project area um, to system-wide for any irrigated properties, irrigated agricultural properties that are designated as transition or removal areas. Uh, this would allow us to address, address prairie dog impacts elsewhere in the system where the scale of the issue may be still relatively small. Um, and as part of this spatial expansion, we also recommend that the existing borough disturbance ordinance uh, be replaced or the disturbance rule be replaced to allow for disturbance to a depth of six inches or up to 12 inches of prior notification on OSMP irrigated agricultural properties. Um, this would allow for consistency across the whole system, um, allow for a little more meaningful level of, um, of, of disturbance, it'd be more meaningful for agricultural practices, and it's pretty widely agreed that it would have minimal impacts to prairie dogs themselves. Most of the properties planned for prairie dog removal would still be within that northern project area. And um, most places where we actually end up removing prairie dogs will be within the northern project area. But the proportion of within the northern project area and elsewhere in the system would vary year to year based on conditions. For item C, we recommend that OSMP purchase equipment and add staffing so that we can do lethal control, barrier maintenance, and other related tasks in-house rather than using contractors. Uh, this would require addition of a fixed term position and one or two temporary crew members, um, but can be paid for within current, currently budgeted expenditures. For item D, um, we propose to cease relocation of prairie dogs to the southern grasslands. And this is as directed in the grassland management plan, as long as prairie dog occupation is 10% or above in any uh, grassland preserve area. Um, as part of this, we'll have to evaluate alternative receiving sites. And this might be prey dog conservation areas within the OSMP system or other receiving sites would be off of OSMP. Um, and so we want to evaluate those and pursue them if they're feasible. Um, if receiving sites are not available, then relocation is not gonna be possible and we would need to explore alternative removal options such as trap and donate to conservation related programs like raptor rehabilitation or black footed bear recovery. For item E, uh, we proposed we need to identify funding and capacity to address irrigation infrastructure needs prior to planning prairie dog removals. Since some of these irrigation issues are complex enough, they can't just be completed as part of the restoration process after prairie dogs are removed. Um, and the benefit of addressing these irrigation needs would also be that that would serve to change what group the property is characterized with in that table that I discussed a couple slides ago. So that demonstrates how those are reflecting current conditions on properties and we can track that in that system. For item F, uh, we would continue to apply the grassland plan 
uh, management designation criteria to properties where prairie dogs are occurring. Um, we apply those criteria where conditions may have changed so that we can ensure that management designations are up to date and accurate for the property. Um, any changes would only be applied based on permanent conditions on a property, such as being permanently severed from water rights or ability to deliver water. So in this, no changes would be made um, if conditions could change, such as simply being in need of repairing water delivery systems. Um, I also want to you know, remind that management designations are based on existing objective criteria that are defined in the grassland management plan. Um, we wouldn't make these changes lightly and any proposed changes would be presented at the annual Prairie Dog meeting. So there would be opportunity for the open space board and the public to comment. And finally, the grassland plan does allow for removal of prairie dogs from irrigated fields regardless of that management designation. So a change in the management designation does not necessarily preclude removal of prairie dogs from irrigated fields if the need should arise. Back to Heather. Yeah, so we, we have kind of, um, and we can come back to this after the, the public hearing and questions, but we have sort of a, a two-part um, recommendations from the board. Um, most of the recommendations are ones that fit within um, imp implementation uh, based on the direction that we were given by city council in 2020, um, with the exception of um, the expansion of the geographic scope outside of that northern project area. So we do have two pieces to this. Um, one is a recommendation to staff from the board and another would be a recommendation to city council. Next slide. Um, so our next steps um, tonight, we'll be talking about recommendations from OSBT. And once we receive those, we'll begin efforts to, implementation, to implement um, the modifications in 2024. And some of that will be things that we'll start in 2023. Um, if we are going to bring that work in-house, um, we do have the approval to go ahead and hire that position um, to purchase equipment, start working on getting that staff member up to speed and trained on, on how to perform the work so that we're ready to go in 24. Um, staff will provide city council with an information packet summarizing the entire process and the full modifications as recommended by OSBT. Um, staff will then bring the, the necessary few items that I just mentioned um, to city council likely in the fall, although we'll need to determine that date um, to talk with them. Um, staff will then present the modifications and the refined plans for implementation at the at the public December um, annual Prairie Dog Update meeting. Um, we'll then present the refined implementation plans based on the modifications to OSBT in January or February as part of our annual Prairie Dog Update and then provide City Council with an information packet on how those modifications impact our 2024 plans management. And then staff will begin implementation using the recommended modifications um, in 2024. Staff. And I think with that, we'll go to clarifying questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, are, there, are there any clarifying questions from the board? You have some? You have some? <clears throat> Please. Um, and, and if this is better in a different part of the discussion, let me know, but I, I'm so good at a handful. So the cost share program, and we discussed this a little bit yesterday the other day. Uh, the, the, the Prairie Dog Working Group made a recommendation in 2018 to Council. We're still working on it in 2023. I can understand why that would be really frustrating to landowners who are looking for someone to share the costs of managing Prairie Dogs on, on fence line. And so I wonder if we could make some firm commitments on that one. That was one of the really, um, and we may hear it more during the hearing, but that was one of the, the things that seem really consistent and um, I don't know if it's if it's germane to go into the minutia but I understand it's kind of parked with the city attorney's office and, and if I understand correctly the issue was whether or not it's an appropriate use of OSMPT funds for, to, to build something on a shared fence line and um, because it wasn't necessarily for OSMP purposes again maybe I'm getting a little bit of the weeds and I would just like to put it out there that I think managing prairie dogs and, and their movement, you know, away from and into our property is absolutely 
uh, in our interests, whether or not it's resting on someone else's fence. And so I think this whole concept that the cost share program that was recommended that we all seem to want is somehow hung up because we don't think it's an OSMP purpose. It to me just doesn't, it just seems like hogwash to me. And, and I, I don't know that the legal question even needs to be called. I just, I think it's fully within our mission. And um, anyway, I just, that's my question. It was kind of more of a statement. But. Sure. Yeah, so maybe a little bit of clarification. I, I think we do have direction from city council to use open space resources in that way. Sure. Um, the <laughs> details are around how to structure the program um, so that it fits within the approval that we've received from city council to do that as well as questions around making it um, equitable and accessible to all neighbors. So those are the things that we've been working with the city attorney's office on. I, I don't think it's accurate to say that it's parked in the city attorney's office. We've gone through several iterations of, of us getting comments, us modifying it, them reevaluating it. So I, I think it, it has been an ongoing process that we're making good progress on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm optimistic that we're getting, we're getting close to it. Um, and I think staff is committed to moving that forward as quickly as we can. Um, can we make a commitment on a date in terms of like, well, we're either going to work it out or we're going to get a new authorization from council in the fall and put these other things in front of them so that we can put this whole thing to rest and, and, and move on actually implementing things in the, in the field. Dan, do you want to speak to that a little bit? I, I, I'm not yeah, I mean, I think the best that we can do at, at this point is commit to providing you with a written update within the, maybe by the September meeting. Do you think that would be reason? You're the ones on the front lines working with all the departments that are involved in this. Do you think by us updating think, the board in September through a written memo of the yeah. status and then? Yeah, I think it'd be helpful. Like I said, I, I am the first to admit, I don't understand the complexities here. Mm -hmm. And I also, after having visited with some of the landowners, just really empathize with the idea that if this was proffered, at least hypothetically in 2018, to, to still be working on it five years later, probably, probably mm -hmm. pretty frustrating. Yep. So I, I think it's a, I think it'd be a meaningful uh, gesture on the city's part to, to really expedite this and, and, and try to meet them where they're at. So I, I appreciate Yep. Yeah, I think the clarifying question is, is there a timeline and, and what is it? Um, and I think if, yeah, if we can get an update on, on its status in, about, you know, in September or whatever, that would be good. But yeah, I think Brady's right that, you know, five years seems like adequate time to, you know, figure something out. And so let's do yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I definitely understand that. And five years does seem like a long time that the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations were extremely extensive. Yeah. And so a right. phased implementation plan was presented to council in, it would have been 2019, I think by that time, although I don't remember the exact date. Um, that phased implementation plan included creation of Tory's position and hiring Tory mm -hmm. um, in 2020, mm -hmm. right? what, six weeks before we went home? She, she had an interesting orientation period. <laughs> um, and so her position was created and hired in 2020. Um, and then we began the phased implementation that we had laid out with city council. So it does seem like a long time. Throughout that time, we have been working on a variety of those recommendations. Um, we've completed a plague management plan. The relocations all fit within that framework. And so it's not that nothing's been happening in the last five years, um, but it was an, a relatively overwhelming list of recommendations. I can only imagine. For right? staff. And so it's like, in some ways, we're kind of translating two realities. You all are neck deep in plans that are, as you just outlined, are going back in time all the way to 2000. And then we have landowners who sit and watch the prairie dogs on the other side of the fence every day for the last five years. Th those are very different realities. And it doesn't mean anybody's not working hard. So how can we kind of mesh those? <clears throat> yep. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is if you can get an update specifically on this issue with a timeline estimation a status, right? Uh, and then we'll we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're targeting the September. Uh, yeah. If that changes, I will update you next time. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to keep these going quicker. So with, with by taking a lethal control in house, um, you said that we. Um, 
you, you, you said we, we 200 acres is a lot. Mm -hmm. And we discussed again this yesterday and, and um, <clears throat> by taking it in house, do you think that our ability to, uh, is, is the, are we basically gonna be uh, working at the same scale that we did when we had contractors or we're gonna take this in house and kind of get good at it and get more efficient and maybe after six months or, you know, is there gonna be some kind of ramp up in terms of our ability to, 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 to work on more acres over time? I think that that's our intention. But I would clarify that a little bit because it's really a trifecta of actions that all need to happen in concert with each other, which is the removal, the restoration, and the barrier installation. And so what we're having to balance is um, looking at each property's colony and how ready is it to, to have barriers installed that we think can work, which varies vastly based on the conditions of each property in the landscape, um, how that fits within our funding in a given year, because some properties that the barriers are relatively inexpensive, other properties, they're extremely expensive. Um, and then do we have the water infrastructure, the water availability, the restoration resources ready to go as soon as the prairie dogs are removed to be able to get that property into a place where, um, it, it may take years to be in, in agricultural production, but where it's being irrigated, where it's vegetated, where we're likely to be able to keep prairie dogs from moving back in. So what we really want to avoid is doing a whole lot of lethal control without the ability to do the follow-up actions that are necessary to actually move us towards success in restoring irrigated agricultural land. And this is where our approach differs from the county. Slightly. I mean, our commitment of uh, these past plans and to minimize lethal control, our barrier program is much more expensive uh, or expansive and we're much more dependent on <clears throat> barriers as a solution to having prairie dogs simply move in and then we're doing lethal control on the same property year in and year out. So in that one component, we're a little different from the county. But I would add going to the county's annual prairie dog meeting, they mentioned that they want to increase use of barriers <clears throat> on their removal sites because they felt like they just were having to go back and back and back and having adding in the, the barrier component they were hoping would increase their success. Yeah, uh, Heather, the lessee situation on, on some of these properties is also a, a factor, right? I mean, when, when we do all of that, we need someone that, you know, is actually going to be, you know, overseeing the property. That, that's right. And, and that makes a huge difference because a lot of that restoration then can be done right. by them. Lots of times it's adjacent to properties that they're currently irrigating. And so the transition back right. into full irrigation is sometimes more smooth. Um, it, you know, and, and that's part of what's happened over the last three years is we've addressed a lot of those properties in the running project area that are mm -hmm. least are adjacent to already functioning irrigated agricultural land. So, you know, the areas around um, Johnson um, are perfect examples of that, where, where Dwayne Cushman has been able to get those very quickly with um, working with Eric Fairley back into very productive um, situations. You know, some of the properties that we have not yet addressed are in a very different situation than that. And so getting the, the infrastructure up to where it needs to be, getting the restoration done to get that property into shape where we'd be able to have a lessee take over. Um, it, it's just gonna be a more substantial effort, which we're absolutely committed to making, but in each year, it may mean that the number of acres isn't what we've been able to accomplish over the last several years, because e each acre is takes more resources, more time, more effort. To be a success. Mm -hmm. I really, it's it's akin to our forestry um, health program. If we're on a even slope and a relatively uh, consistent stand, we may be able to do a, a thinning project of 200 acres in a given year. If we're the same amount of capacity and resources are built to a steep slope situation, we may be able to spend the same amount of time, but we may only get to 110 acres of thinning in that particular An acre and an acre and an acre. Based on the characteristics of that. So that's not an apples to apples comparison, but it gives you a little bit of flavor of, it's not like we're taking resources away. It's the same amount of resources, but it, it could amount to 200 acres one year 
135 in another year based on characteristics. So. But I would say that bringing that capacity in house, part of that is a cost saving measure. And part of it is certainly to have increased capacity, not only for doing those removals, we've had a hard time with contractor availability. And so some removals have actually oh, taken sure. into the next year to complete so the ones that were there. planned for 22 weren't actually completed until at early 23. So hopefully we'll get away from that. Okay. that so this is a really big development taking it. It, it is, and, and it will give us additional capacity for things like barrier maintenance for some of that irrigation infrastructure work, um, you know, for a number of needs related to the program. Okay. Two more questions. Is, is there any instance in which for key line plowing, it, the, the, the blanket approvals for six inches, 12 with, uh, with notification, is there any instance in which someone would notify the city and the city would say, actually, you know, you can't do that? Um. That's an interesting question. We actually have never been asked, so that's never been tested. Because I'm just wondering um, if, 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 the, if the threshold is notification, but there's no there's no scenario in which the city would say no, why don't we just say 12 inches and then just make it simple and just be done with it? Because you know, I, I talked to somebody who's a prairie dog advocate, and, um, and I don't want to speak for this person, but this person said, listen, we're not going to be decapitating prairie dogs. 12 inches and if they get buried they're going to dig them their way out they, they can they can handle it and so i just wonder if we can just simplify the, the policy and just say 12 inches and, and we're done with it and that really wasn't something that was discussed because again we haven't had any requests for that from agricultural operators so it didn't seem Request to plow to 12 inches. Right. In the presence of prairie dogs, because once prairie yeah, dogs, without are, prairie dogs they can do are removed, you can want. you do whatever you yeah, want. You want. Yeah, but this yeah. is in the presence of prairie dogs. I mean, this is I just wondering if we can simplify the policy. And, and why are we asking people to tell us when they're going to go to 12 when we basically will tell them, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I do think that one difference with that is that the um, the what the property looks like after six inches of plowing versus 12 inches of plowing is pretty substantially different. And um, we do have community members who become concerned when they think that prairie dogs have been controlled someplace where they didn't know that they were going to be controlled. And sometimes plowing to 12 inches can look like that's what's the- oh, So that's why you want notifications so when, when the calls come in, you know what happened? Is that the We know what's happening. We can look at the situation. The, the other thing is we do want to avoid situations where we might have other sensitive species within that prairie dog colony um, that 12 inches might impact. Burrowing owls. So something like burrowing owls or- um, that would probably be the most likely. So there are instances in which someone would say, hey, I want to go 12 inches and you might say no. I think it's possible. Okay. Um, I think it's possible. I, I don't know that it's likely, but I think it's possible. We might ask them to follow like a different time frame outside the breeding season or something, if that was a concern. Okay, last question. Um, uh, one of the goals was to identify funding and capacity to address the irrigation infrastructure and um, I have to imagine that identifying funding and capacity is something that we need to do for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? Like I, I can just, you know, obviously there's some strategy behind that. We're not waiting for <clears throat> manna from heaven to come down and pay for this, but like what, what is, where would we look? And, and, and can you tell the, us like what, what, what would that look like? What might a reasonable time frame be? Or is it, is it just sort of, yeah. Yeah, what's the time frame on that? Well, I mean, I think within our, you know, you've, you've seen the 24 budget and we'll be going through a, a similar process for 25 um, where, you know, all of the department's needs are, are discussed and, and prioritized. And, and if additional new funding is needed someplace, you know, we see where that fits within the picture. So I think as far as timing, that would be something that um, I would be working with Andy and our new water resources administrator once they're hired, um, which hopefully will be in the near future, um, to identify, you know, what resources really are needed. And part of that is taking this initial um, evaluation of properties that we've done and digging deeper on some of those properties to really figure out, okay, the infrastructure needs a lot of help. Now, what exactly does that mean? And what are our estimates so that we can put together a multi-year plan of how we would like to address that on those properties. And so that would then inform our, you know, requests for funding each year. 
mm -hmm. um, depending on where we were in that plan. So, I, you know, I think as far as timing is concerned, that would be something that we would start pretty much immediately to feed into our upcoming conversations for the 25 budget and, and then beyond. And as far as where the money would come from, you know, it, it wouldn't be that we would take it from here and put it here. It would be more that it would be in the mix of the, the departmental discussions around funding priorities. And um, I, don't, I don't know if you've been- Yeah, no, well, well, we discussed whether or not to actually include this as a modification because you're right, it's uh, water irrigation infrastructure maintenance is something we've done for many years. I think we spent almost $600,000 in the CIP alone over the last three or four years mm -hmm. just on maintaining it. I think this is a, a transparency issue that we wanted to call this particular issue out is sometimes before we can do a removal, we have to make that investment. So it was one way of calling out a particular item that maybe wasn't as highlighted in the 2020 set of recommendations that we wanted to call out. It was also kind of a call out internally to staff saying, hey, we need to really be coordinated here. That you may think that head gate needs to be replaced over there, but if it's a, a if, if we're trying to weigh whether to replace that head gate or replace this infrastructure that's related to this program, maybe we look to that for the next year rather than and wait on that. So it's also a call out to our staff to work closely on aligning our needs on that and meshing at that Venn diagram to be looking at this program. Yeah, because I think irrigation wise, it, it we probably ought to be clear that, you know, staff irrigating are, are, will not be irrigating agricultural lands per se for agricultural purposes. They're, the staff will probably be irrigating for restoration uh, primarily. And if there, if there is going to be an agricultural use, that has to be provided by a tenant or some, someone else other than staff so that when, when people are saying, well, you know, the, the irrigation infrastructure is, is ready to go, but if, if there's no one actually to irrigate, then that is, you know, irrelevant. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, that's not a factor. And so we, we ought to be clear that when, when we get a property ready that we need someone to, you know, actually help. Yeah, and I would say, Dave, that we have a number of unleased properties that we're working to identify that. And, and that's period before we have a lease, we are the managers of it and right. we do need to run the water. And we have instances where we are running the water ourselves. I, the ideal condition is to bring in that right. lease. But it's not, we're not running it to grow crops or anything. We're running it to, you know, maintain a vegetative cover or to restore. With the know, hopes that in year three, we're, right. we're growing crops. Yes. Where does restoration end in agriculture again? It's not like there's this snap. I mean, presumably. Yeah. <laughs> to one of them. Well, so, I, I mean, for instance, um, open space staff are not harvesting crops, right? We're, we're not haying right. properties. We're not. So at the point that a, that a property is ready to support um, you know, a, a, an actual production of crops, it's probably then ready for our, you know, to go through our leasing process to identify a lessee. Because you're right, that, that's exactly where we want to be. Right. Um, our, our water resources staff does a lot of irrigation, um, some of which is necessary because it's, it's not agricultural land. Um, but certainly on those properties that are, are producing profitable agricultural crops, our model is that we have lessees. I, mean, I think a good example is before Dan buried the, the uh, vehicle out of the field trip. We created a new lateral. lateral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Instantly appears. Uh, but that property was it was being restored, but it was being irrigated by open space. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's the process of getting it. You know, and part of the, the conversation in 2020 is that one of the goals of the program is to move unleased properties back into right. a leasable condition. And so that that's really, I mean, the, the restoration is focused on a number of things, you know, soil quality and vegetation cover. And, but all of that is with the ultimate goal that, you know, if it's an irrigated agricultural property, it's leasable right. and, and that we're able to have tenants. on. Eric, I see, are you anxiously wanting to join the conversation? Oh, I looked for Eric. 
Eric and I didn't see him. I'm sorry. I would have called on you long ago. <laughs> uh, you're all doing great. Yeah. All right. Uh, any further? No, no, I'm done. Sorry. Okay, uh, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, John. Uh, unmuted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I appreciate all the thought and time uh, that's been put into this presentation and that staff has put into listening to the community. Also wanted to give a shout out to Brady, who's done a great job uh, immersing himself in Prairie Dog and Prairie Dog issues. Um, you've you've done an awesome job uh, having only been here a couple months, just really wrapping your head around this issue. And I, I appreciate the effort you put into that. So, great. Uh, I think we're ready for our public hearing. So, Sam? Yes. Um, yes, so we have eight uh, speakers signed up in advance. If you would also like to speak, um, you can raise your hand using the function on the bottom of your screen or by clicking on participants and then selecting it from there. And we don't have anyone joining by phone. Uh, so to start us off for public comment, we'll start with Elizabeth Black, followed by Lynn Siegel, and then Andy Breiter. Oh, um, let's do three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Elizabeth Black, um, we'll start with you, and you should be able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Elizabeth Black, 4340 North 13th Street. Here are five things that make staff's proposal better. First, don't abandon the Northern Project area. Make a firm commitment that at least 50% of your prey dog removal acreage will be in the Northern Project area each year going forward. Second, increase lethal control to 200 acres per year so that you can make some decent progress in the face of rapid prairie dog population growth. Third, make no changes in designations to properties. It's much too soon. Redesignating properties as multiple objective areas or prairie dog conservation areas means that uncontrolled prairie dogs will be on the property forever. That will have ongoing financial impacts, property damage, soil erosion, and ecosystem degradation for OSAP properties and neighboring landowners. Fourth, restore irrigation to match or improve on what was there when the property was purchased. Rent, lease, buy, exchange, or move water rights and upgrade water systems for water short properties in the Northern Project area. We understand that it is really hard for OSMP to accomplish what previous farmers and ranchers on their lands were able to do, but we do not agree that these lands are not irrigable just because the irrigation is hard. Finally, improve neighbor relations by implementing a barrier cost sharing program immediately, managing weeds and controlling erosion on your ag lands effectively, and collaborating with neighbors. We believe that these changes will go a long way in improving neighbor relations as well as the conditions of OSMP's agricultural lands. You know, it's really hard watching this department make bad decisions about prairie dogs on ag lands. It's like watching a teenage boy constantly making bad choices. Sooner or later, that boy will get caught and have to face the music. We hope it's sooner and you hope he's a learner and not a repeater. Right now, this department is looking like a repeater, not a learner. And you know what? The folks in this department do not even have to face the music. It's the taxpayers, your neighbors, our land, our soil, and Boulder's agricultural community that is having to pay the price for these bad decisions. I've been watching Boulder's bad decisions and the destruction of our ag lands for over 20 years now. And I tell you, it's just really, really hard to watch. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next, we have Lynn Siegel, followed by Andy Breiter, Paula Schuler, and Suzanne Webel. So, 
Lynn Siegel, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yay, three minutes in one of the windows. Hallelujah. Yes, I'm speaking to some real human beings. If you can call yourself that after firing Caroline Miller. I am opposed to any lethal manipulation of the prairie dog po population. They were here before us. If you want to have horses, let the horse ride you. That's what I say to my cousins who are professional horse riders. So, you know, I don't have a lot of empathy for the horse population. And prairie dogs were here first. And leave them alone, Brady, leave them alone. John, Michelle, Dave, leave the prairie dogs alone. And, you know, I've been watching this prairie dog issue since 1987, before Brady was probably born. So I've been around the block. I've seen him push from one place to another place, seen him down push towards the Marshall landfill where there's plutonium for them to munch on with their feast. You know, the prairie dogs deserve some grasses to eat too. So leave the prairie dog alone. Leave them alone. And you think it's got to, got to be an expense here, you know? I heard something here. We just had a budget hearing before this. I just heard uh, there's some really expensive ways of putting in the underground fences, you know? Well, what about that? You know? Um, sounds like there's plenty of expenses here that are not being funded. And that's kind of a big issue. And the more use, the more horses, the more people with interests against the prairie dog, the more trouble you can have from people like me that do not like to kill wild animals, sentient beings. Done. Thank you, Lynn. Let the record show that I was born in 1972. Yeah, I, I, want, <laughs> I want you to know, Lynn, that uh, Brady was uh, has been around the block before he was even born. So uh, just so you know. Who, who's up next, uh, uh, Sam? We have Andy Brader, Paula Schuler, and then Suzanne Webel. Um, and Andy, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Andy Brighter. I live at 4344 North 95th Street in Lafayette, Colorado, which is a property that OSMP owns. Um, I am a rancher who leases land from City of Boulder, OSMP. And when I look at the overpopulation of prairie dogs on much of the properties, I believe that that is a symptom of a deep issue, which is the rural urban interface that we live in. That historic landscape that Lynn was talking about there didn't have tech centers and subdivisions that intersected all our properties. So that makes it a very difficult issue for OSMP to be able to manage these lands, especially considering that the city charter states that one of the main goals for OSMP acquiring land is to preserve agricultural use on that on those properties. Um, I think overall the recommendations that I saw put forward are really well done. And I think that over the past three years as I've been paying attention to this work, I think that OSMP as a whole has done a lot of really good work to reduce conflict. I do think that lethal control is a tool, one of many tools that we need to create healthy ecosystems on our land. One of my main concerns with the proposals is the categorizing of the different properties. I work with five other individuals and organizations on a project that we seek to find coexistence strategies with prairie dogs. And I think one of the biggest learnings that we found over the past two and a half years that we've been working on this project, 
that would not be made possible without private citizens funding is how much additional labor and work goes into working in coexistence with Prairie Dog. Um, that additional work is also at the loss of production for the agricultural product that I produce. And I say again that a lot of that work is done because of private citizen funding. So I'm concerned as you start to categorize the project to seek coexistence with prairie dogs, which I do think is possible overall. We must understand that there's a lot of resources that need to go into those projects. I also want to talk about uh, Mr. Robinson's question about 12 inches. As somebody who has used the key line plow, I do think that the deeper that you can go with it actually makes that implement more effective. And that three inches, which what we're currently allowed is pretty much ineffective as a use of that tool. Six inches will start to make that tool more effective, but it is really a 12 to 18 inch tool. Overall, I want to say thank you all for the work that you've put into these conflict strategies, and I hope to continue to see you guys working on that. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate your comments. Next is Paula Schuler, followed by Suzanne Webel and Kevin Markey. Paula, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, I would like to comment tonight on some of staff's modifications and ask you to make changes to their proposed recommendations. This is a bit of a challenge because staff has lumped separate items together in a few of their recommendations. In several cases, I would agree with a part of the recommendation, but I believe OSBT needs to modify the other part. In my opinion, it would be harmful for agriculture in Boulder County and this program for OSBT to rubber stamp these recommendations as they are written. Staff has started evaluating properties based on priority tiers, categories, and now characteristics. Which is it? It appears to me as a farmer and neighbor of OSMP lands that this new layer, these categories present more reasons, more excuses, not to remove prairie dogs from properties that were originally approved for removal in the preferred alternative. What does category D stand for? Death to agriculture? It should stand for don't give up so easily. I would like the trustees to ask OSMP to remove prairie dogs and restore properties from each one of the categories A through D every year. Expanding prairie dog removal beyond the Northern project area is good, but please do not let OSMP walk away from the original project area. After removals are finished in 2023, over half the original project area acres will, will remain waiting for management. I would like the trustees to ask OSMP to commit to managing at least 50% of any removal acres to the original project area in 2024 and several years beyond. OSMP needs to increase lethal control to 200 acres per year, and there is no reason they cannot do that. OSMP could easily treat all of category A outside the project area, as well as 125 acres inside the northern project area. And in-house crews, not contractors, will make this absolutely possible. In-house crews should also be building barriers. Finally, I'm very much against changing any of the designations for any parcel. It is way too early in the process. The removal transition and MOAs in the Northern Project area are almost all agricultural lands of statewide importance. They received this designation because of their water, soil quality, and their importance for agriculture. According to the USDA, farmland of statewide importance may include tracts of land designated for agriculture by state law. Changing any of these designations and allowing prairie dogs to remain is wrong and absolutely contrary to the city charter master plan and contrary to why this program was approved. Farming and agriculture is something very challenging sometimes very challenging. In my opinion, coexistence is not ideal and I'm a member of the Shared Learning Collaborative. Get water back on these lands, remove the prairie dogs and regenerate these agricultural acres. Please do not approve all of the recommendations as written. Some of these recommendations are good, but several appear to counteract what this entire project was created for. The project is supposed to be healing agricultural lands, not adding more acres of prairie dogs. OSBT needs to provide guidance and staff needs to do another revision and value agriculture over prairie dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, next, we have Suzanne Webel followed by Kevin Markey and Jonathan Moore. 
Suzanne, you should be able to unmute yourself now. I think I did. Yes, we can hear you. Suzanne Webel, 5735 Prospect Road, unincorporated Boulder County. I'm not generally a believer in miracles, but one has just taken place, actually a couple of them. I was walking along the Boulder Feeder Canal last Thursday to show some visitors the weedy mess at Bennett, when lo and behold, an OSMP crew had just finished mowing some of the worst weeds on Bennett on both sides of the canal. And they were just getting started mowing on steel just west of 55th Street. Amazingly, I also noticed that somebody has started to irrigate both properties. Yay. Thank you to staff for this miracle. You're off to a great start. My plea now is keep it up. The irrigation infrastructure is in place. You have the water and you've reseeded the properties, but please be careful or it'll grow even more prairie dogs. On my farm, which is immediately south of Bennett, I have made a deal with my prairie dogs in order to maintain an ecological balance. There are places where they can stay, the high dry mesas where I can't irrigate and places where they can't stay, my irrigated hay fields. I've made it work because I've been passionate about making it work. I watch it like a hawk and I baby it every day. But truthfully, this land is fragile. If you want to restore agriculture, that's great. Perhaps the best objective for Bennett and Steel and properties like it is to restore a healthy functioning prairie. Keep the prairie dogs under control or you won't be able to achieve anything. Mow it frequently to keep weed seeds out of the ecosystem. Spray for noxious weeds when you have to and keep the water coming. Maybe don't worry about finding a tenant right away and open the properties to the public so they can see what successful management looks like. I'll be happy to work with staff to make success happen. I do have one individual request though. Please install a chicken wire barrier the length of our common property line on your fence at your expense to keep your prairie dogs on your side of the fence. You bought it, you broke it, now it's up to you to fix it. I submitted my recommendations separately for the plan in general, which I hope you will incorporate. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Next, we have Kevin Markey, followed by Jonathan Moore and Will Palmer. So, Kevin, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. My name is Kevin Markey. My wife and I live on a, uh, about, uh, three, about a quarter of a mile south of Bennett and Steele. We, form a por we farm a portion of our 39 acres selling produce, jams, jellies, and relishes at seasonal fairs and markets. We leased most of our property for dryland grazing. We have our own prairie dog control problem, and we attempt at considerable cost, especially the physical labor involved, to keep the population down to a dull roar. We're concerned about the poor management of OSMP properties because of the weeds they spread and the migration of prairie dogs in the neighborhood. In spite of pre, uh, staff presentation tonight, entirely missing from the staff's recommended, recommended proposal is an explicit policy improving neighbor relations. Specifically, legal impediments must be overcome to immediately implement a barrier cost sharing program. Five years is long enough to wait. Weeds and erosion must be effectively managed on all OSMP agricultural properties. We recently saw OSMP mowing weeds on Bennett and Steel, as Suzanne has mentioned. This was the first time we've seen this in years. We pray it was not merely a cynical move to look good in the face of a planned field trip. Staff needs to more <laughs> effectively communicate and collaborate with neighbors. We have knowledge and ideas we can share to ease their work, increase their effectiveness, and avoid misunderstandings. In one, uh, in the distributed uh, proposal, there's uh, the uh, categories that came under withering scrutiny at the last meeting 
have been eliminated. Of course, that seems to be a moving target. If they're eliminated, it has the unfortunate effect of making staff judgments about each project property entirely opaque. It would have been sufficient to clarify the conflicting definitions and explicitly state that they were descriptive and not prescriptive. With categories gone, we repeat our recommendation <coughs> that staff publish online concise narratives for each property and detailed suggestions are in our written testimony. Uh, there are several proposals are unacceptable within, without timelines and specific goals. Geographic expansion of the program is unacceptable without a commitment that most of the control efforts be concentrated in the northern program area and without increasing legal, lethal control to 200 acres per year. Evaluation of irrigation infrastructure needs is something that should already be part of staff responsibilities. Instead, we need a commitment to complete that evaluation by the end of this year in time to obtain funding commitments to implement the findings. At the conclusion of our written statement, I provide a new version of staff recommendations amended to reflect an acceptable plan that meets the city's responsibilities to its neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next, we have Jonathan Moore followed by Will Palmer. Jonathan, you should be able to unmute yourself now. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Moore. I live with my wife, Catherine, at 5740 Prospect Road. It's a 31 acre kind of irrigated homestead property. We sit south and east of Bennett and Steele. Uh, we sit north and west of a city property near Boulder Hills. Can't remember the name of that. Uh, I'm speaking kind of one as a concerned neighbor citizen. Uh, first, wholeheartedly, 100% support, endorse the comments made uh, by subject matter experts, Elizabeth Black and Paula Schuler, and wholeheartedly endorse the comments you guys are hearing and have visited with, you know, Kevin Markey, Suzanne Webb, among others. My second set of comments are as a practitioner. Um, honestly, I've spent four decades preserving what's unique about Colorado. I work for local governments. I've been a planning commissioner. I cut my teeth with Ron Stewart and Ray Prince as leaders in this state. I was a deputy director of a conservation organization for 12 years. I have basically protected ag lands, working landscapes, water rights, scenic quarters, historic landscapes, threatened endangered species. As uh, Director Burke knows, you know, I've, it's, it's a world where you spend time between private landowners, cities, counties, states, national entities, and you find ways to come up with solutions. So my takeaways are, uh, which I did say on June 14th, when you buy land, when you buy an easement, you do take on a moral and ethical responsibility to be good stewards of that land. That's weed management, that's soil health, that's forage, that's water rights, that's ecological kind of balance. Obviously, prairie dogs is the topic tonight. And you also take on a responsibility to be a good neighbor. And that's obviously what you've heard from this northern group of people on is, you know, we're just asking you guys to be good neighbors. Uh, we've been working and spending time, money and resources, you know, every year after year, all of us started with rough properties and we've worked to improve them. Uh, so I, I, I think that's what I really want you to take away is, you know, you own it, please care for it, leave it better than when you got it. That's, you know, it's a kind of simple land ethic. Uh, just because it's hard, just because it's expensive, you know, doesn't give you the ability to reclassify these lands, to shift the priorities. You know, Bennett and Steele did have irrigation on them. You already lost one good tenant on there and I, another one, arguably, perhaps not. But, you know, you've had two tenants that have walked away from that property. It's a it's a weed infested mess. It's embarrassing to walk by that property and you all should do it if you haven't. Um, so, you know, as, as, as you know, private owners are held to a high bar. The city, the county, you are you're held to a higher bar than that. You are leaders. Do the right thing with these properties. You have allowed, and I'm learning more as I go, I have not had a lot of time, you know, that you've basically allowed the prairie dogs to proliferate and become out of balance. You know, it's arguably neglect on your part. So I ask you, you own it. Please work hard to maintain it. Please take the subject matter experts' recommendations, uh, find barriers, find more money, find partnerships. You know, we are happy to work with you and love to, but you guys do have to take the first steps to bring these lands back. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. 
Um, next is Will Palmer, followed by Andy Young. Will, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Can you hear me? We can Hello? hear you. Oh, okay. Um, so I have many issues with the prey dog thing. Uh, firstly, we're having a war against emu, just like Australia did. So it's getting out of hand. But you need to let these lands go back to the farmers because we really do need to establish these as agricultural resources. Uh, what has happened is in the past, we had canines, we had the wild wolves, we had the bobcats, we had the mountain lions. Okay, all of these were taking out the prey dogs. And in the meantime, the buffalo were beaten down the ground. This is no longer the agricultural reality that we have today. And by leaving it just the prairie dogs, we are creating a desertification across the entire property. Now, I, I live right next to steel property here. And it's really saddening to me because I have to run my water through that property. So I have to actually walk that property to get my water running. Um, and it is completely overrun with weeds and it is turning into dust. That's not the, you know, logic that was given when all of these farmers, all of these ranchers actually, uh, were selling their property to the city. The whole point was to keep them as an open space so they, it was, you know, clear view and it was pleasant to be on, pleasant to see, uh, but, still maintaining the farming reality we have. We've kind of lost sight of that. Um, so I, you know, urge you to reevaluate what these properties actually were meant to be. Uh, because the reality is our entire landscape has changed quite a bit over the last 200 years, multiple times. And where it is now to leave it purely to prairie dogs is a mistake. And to try and put more prairie dogs there is not gonna help the prairie dogs that are there. Thank you, Will, appreciate your comments. And then next is Andy Young. Andy, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Andy Young and I live at 7528 North Foothills Highway in Boulder, Colorado. And that's an OSMP property. I'm a local rancher um, and I'm speaking tonight um, on behalf of myself and my family and not uh, for any of the organizations that I represent here in Boulder. A number of the things that were mentioned this evening that kind of come to the surface for me um, as a young farmer that already faces so many challenges to accessing, as accessing farmland, it can be really discouraging to see so much effort and so much funding going toward really the problem. It seems to be a focus in the wrong area. Um, and to repeat the gentleman right before me, um, I'm just here to express as a young farmer and rancher, the desire to be involved and to do the work I know from watching prairie dog mitigation efforts in the city and the county, seeing just how much effort and how much labor and all the fencing and stuff that is, um, knowing that those funds can probably do more work and that the farmers and ranchers, I mean, I feel like even having Andy Brider here in this conversation, there's so many young people with a heart in the game that care about the land and the ground. And it seems like um, just listening to this, that we're overly focused on the problem of prairie dogs and maybe focusing more on some of the solutions could provide some of the, the answers and the needs that you have, like young farmers irrigating and working the land. Um, as a transgender, queer, disabled farmer, um, I like to sometimes point the shift of focus and the power. And oftentimes it can be the people that are most affected by a problem that have some of the best solutions to offer. And so thinking about the folks that are committed and working the ground and working these agricultural leases and 
desire to grow food and to produce food for Boulder County. I think it's uh, it's in the heart of these folks that can be why and how we can get out of some of this prairie dog trouble. Um, and I know not only is there me, but there's a whole army of folks, young and upcoming farmers that want to be involved and they're having trouble accessing land. And um, so I agree, we need to increase lethal control. Uh, we need to recruit young farmers and put a lot of this land back into agricultural use. Um, and please don't change more designation. Let's keep our farmland working and get as much of it back into good use as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. And uh, so if you would like to speak, please raise your hand. Not seeing any new hands. Great. Uh, we'll close the public comment and return to the board for further discussion. Uh, do board members have any further comments, questions, or suggestions? I have one question. Yeah. A, a lot of people uh, beseeched us not to redesignate plans. Have we suggested that we would do such a thing in the near future? You said it, it, it would be, so it's something that we do already with new acquisitions, new colonies, when conditions change on a colony. Um, that's kind of ongoing process as conditions change. We have said that if there were properties where the conditions have changed permanently from what they were when their original designation was given, that we might take a look at those. And if we had proposals for those, we would present them to the public. Um, so what does that feedback. process look like? So, so that looks like capturing the conditions on the property and just running back through the criteria and rescoring the criteria for the property do, that was done at the time of the grassland plan. Do those uh, recommendations come to the board or is that a, a staff decision? Or? That would be a staff decision, but we've definitely committed that we would uh, present those to the public as proposals at the annual meeting and then bring them to and collect public feedback and then bring the proposal and that feedback to the board for board feedback in the annual prairie dog. There'd be a recommendation back to, right. if you had feedback or recommendation back to staff. Right. But the we wouldn't be changing the policy. We'd just be right. implementing the, how it works uh, and we would collect community and board feedback. Okay. Uh, so my question following uh, uh, Brady's is, uh, it's not necessarily incumbent on us to change designations in 2024. Absolutely not. So are, are we okay? And, and I don't want to kick the can down the road, but I... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh, <laughs> All right. I guess that uh, <laughs> concludes the conversation. <laughs> Uh, so we don't want to do, let's shed some lamps. <laughs> <laughs> we need brighter lights than this. Um, I don't want to kick the can down the road, but I, I do think it might be worth building a little buffer into, you know, kind of what that means exactly. And, and so what I'm wondering is, you know, what, what I guess I'm hearing is that we need to make uh, probably a more concerted effort to establish the trust with two groups that I think are extremely important for uh, agricultural land management. One are the neighbors and the other are the tenants or lessees. And for me, it's, it's like, you know, meeting probably fairly frequently and not in an annual community, you know, um, meeting, but kind of on the ground, uh, making sure that we know and they know, you know, kind of what uh, the prospects are, or what's intended um, in the coming near term. And so what I'm wondering is if what we want to, we, we need to, be, I think I'm hearing, we need to look at kind of, okay, what's the most effective way to work with the neighbors? And I, my question would be back to many of the commenters tonight, what in their minds, would be the best, you know, communication uh, process as far as they were concerned, and um, and how best to do that. But the the key thing for me is that 
I, I think people are feeling anxious that when this goes to council, you know, it, it's going to be a, a definitive edict and there's not going to be a whole lot of uh, ability to, you know, kind of work things out. And so my recommendation and board members can chime in certainly if they want to is to maybe build a little buffer in for 2024. Um, and kind of see if we, we can try some, you know, I don't want to say community engagement because that that has a, you know, kind of an already defined bureaucratic meaning, but mostly it's sitting down with with uh, neighbors and tenants and, and kind of working through, okay, here's what we'll do, you know, can you do this or that? Um, so I think that if we can put some more specific commitment language in the motion for 2024, uh, I would feel more comfortable and I think uh, hopefully folks will feel heard. Um, so I, I guess that's my rather inelegant way <laughs> of uh, say, saying I, uh, I think that if we can reduce the anxiety <clears throat> that this motion is going to, you know, be cast in stone for the foreseeable future and put it in a context of, okay, for 2024, here's kind of uh, what our focus is going to be. Can I start? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to clarify that <clears throat> all the motions except for the expansion of the project area are at the management level, which are fluid and transparent, and we certainly could revisit those at any time. Council, for instance, would not, we wouldn't right. need an action right. of council. Right. So I think what we're trying to do is being transparent as possible, saying <clears throat> we're working within the policy, but we want to call out from a management level some refinements we're going to make, and we want to be transparent and have these community conversations. Have board, and we'd be more than happy to report out in 2024. And if if there's other refinements or continuing refinements. You all feel like we should make more, more than willing to have those conversations. So I'm, I actually am not quite getting <laughs> what you're saying, as opposed to how it would fit into a recommendation here. Right. All right. And, so and I'm asking board members to weigh in as well. I was just trying to say yeah. that, you know, I think if we look at this motion in the context of look, it. It for, it's primarily for 2024. Now the, the council part of it may be- a That is a policy guidance yeah, we need to change. Thing, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, we get agreement and understanding on that if, you know, we make some more specific, I hate to use the word commitments, but, um, you know, agreements that, you know, here's where uh, our efforts are going to be focused in 2024. So let me just address just one tiny piece of what you talked about, which was the management area designations. And I can say that we don't have any proposals right. now, right? right? So we've done the initial look across the properties to look at what conditions are. We've done kind of a high level grouping of those properties so that we know where to really focus our next looks and deeper dives into what the properties require. Um, you know, and anything related to management designations would follow that. Um, you know, we're, we're entering our, the relocation and removal season. We're gonna be hiring a new crew. Get in. We're not gonna be getting to any of this as far as management area. These kind of right. follow on actions later on anytime soon. So, I mean, we have no intention to be proposing any of those for 24, even if we wanted to. I, I don't think we'd be ready for that. I, I think we have a lot more fact finding to do on those properties, looking at what alternatives might exist, what they'll take to implement and you know where it's possible or not possible. So I think we're a ways off from that. Okay. Um, that, that one particular thing. Right. I mean, some of these, our intention is absolutely to implement them in 2024. Can I make a comment? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've thought it was an interesting comment, Andy Young, 
made about or focused on the problem as opposed to the possible solutions and kind of what we're going for. I thought that was a, a good reframe. And, and I was thinking about um, Suzanne Webble, what, what she said, you know, we, we took a walk with her and, and she was really surprised that the weeds right next to her property in Bennett had been mowed. And, and so if, when we think about the qualities of what makes a good neighbor, a good neighbor informs their neighbors about their plans and there's not surprises or when there are, there's recourse. And so I was just thinking, you know, there's one of the themes here is, is a lack of trust is, and, and Suzanne said, wow, it almost felt miraculous that it was mowed to the extent that she wonders a little bit in the back of her mind, was that for the benefit of this, this uh, meeting? But no, probably not. If this is, let's just take this at face value. It's a really good thing. Will it happen again? And I think a, if, if we, if one of our things we're trying to embody as a, as a landowner, as, as, a, as an entity, as being a good neighbor, then we would put some, I can't tell you how to do it, but there'd be some mechanism in place where Suzanne and everyone else would know that, hey, mowing's on the docket and I can expect it to be mowed before it goes to seed. And I don't have to sit in, in, in anxiety, hoping that the city mows the, pro, the, the weeds before they go to seed. I just wonder if there's some, you know, if, if we start to think about it as like, what makes a good, I know that isn't reflected in the policy documents, but what makes a good neighbor? And what are some of the qualities of, of, of good neighborhoodness, whatever, can we embody? One of the things that good neighbors do is they sit down and have iced tea together around a table, which is what Dave and I did. And it made everybody feel better. You know, nothing changed, but just everybody felt better. Um, and so, I don't want to sound too Pollyannish, but I really think if we think about, as Andy said, what is what is the, the thing that we're, we want? Um, and what are the qualities of, of being a good neighbor and without violating any of the, the, the planning documents and, and, and any existing policy, what are things that within our own management discretion we can do to kind of embrace that ideal, I think would go a long way. And so maybe that's like the policy direction be a good neighbor <laughs> and really think deeply about what that means. And then the, the last thing I'd say, and then I, I want to defer to those of you who know more about this. So in, in a lot of planning processes um, that I'm familiar with at the federal level, you know, the, the, the entity puts forward possible things and then there's a comment period and you collect the comments, you get them back. And uh, Kevin referenced an email that he sent. He sent it today at three o'clock. Um, I read through it as I was ordering pizza for my kid, <laughs> you know, so to, uh, and I didn't have enough time to digest it. And I certainly don't have enough time to, to take what he wrote and, and try to incorporate it into a new motion and we can put it on the screen and we're so tired and cross-eyed trying to, uh, uh, you know, redraft something. I just wonder if, if, if in this case, we need another bite of the apple. Maybe there's parts of, of the proposed Maybe it's the maybe it's the the uh, expansion of the of the management area. Maybe that's something that's important. We need to do that for the council. But I wonder if there's an opportunity for us to mull over some of the great feedback and comments we got, and and think about these things and come back with another version. And I, again, I don't want to kick the, the ball down the field too much, but um, I just don't think we've had enough time. I certainly haven't to incorporate and think deeply about these thoughtful comments and feedback. That we've gotten, and if this is highly unusual recommendation, you know, again, I'm I'm fairly new here, but just an observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I that that's basically what I'm trying to say is well. So my question is: Is there a time requirement for the motions? In, in other words, staff staff wise for the you know the main motion or council wise for the second one uh, that would preclude us from doing, I think what Brady and I, I probably Michelle too, uh, think, you know, would be good. You know, part of my, my question is that we've got a community outreach group and I don't want to dump, you know, all of this requirement on the, on, on your work group, but the department has, you know, community outreach people that could certainly do some of this work that we're talking about as far as you know bringing uh 
neighbors and staff together and stuff so that you wouldn't have to you know, be responsible or be required to necessarily do that in addition to everything else. But uh, it just strikes me that we might want to be thinking about, okay, yeah, we've gotten some good feedback. Yeah, how can we best incorporate what we've heard into, um, you know, being more effective, uh, you know, kind of working being better neighbors, working together more, being more collaborative. Um, you know, what What I keep hearing or we keep hearing is that about the county, the county, you know, does this much better, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's what we hear. And I much prefer hearing the city does this much better <laughs> than, you know, than any, anyone else. And so how can we get to that point where you know, people are saying, you know, it's really good that, you know, to work with the city because, you know, they they really listen and they really kind of uh, incorporate, they know what they're doing and they incorporate, you know, suggestions into, you know, whatever it is they're doing. Can I uh, chime in a little yeah. bit? Thank, thanks to both of you for um, really meeting with a lot of people and, and going deep on this issue. What I'm hearing is that um, from both of you is that, and, and also from the, those who spoke, is they would that, that that they would like to have more communication with staff, um, and not just an annual meeting. Um, is there a compromise in here possible where we're not completely hunting um, what's been asked for us and what we've building up been building up toward the last several months? Because we have um, a recommendation here, one that is really a management recommendation, and then a second one that's going to council. It sounds like we have agreement on number two on, on council. Um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we have that and taken take perk of mutual control in house. I think we agree on that. Yeah, so yeah. it sounds like we are in agreement with all of it except for communication. Is that right? Is, is, there, is there a compromise in where we could add a G, not like totally, you know, like edit this whole thing, but have some, um, our recommendation to staff to meet with um, constituents, whatever that period of time is outside of the annual meeting, but, but is there a second one is, is, with that? Could I just help? A couple things. So neighbor relations is not currently part of the 2020 program. So adding that as a modification would be adding it as a modification to add it to the program, not to tweak what we're doing. Um, we have, you know, I'd be very interested in exactly what you're thinking about, because we have um, a large number of one-on-one -on -one meetings with neighbors every single year on their property to talk about these issues. And so I'm curious how what you're proposing differs from that. Um, what, what's happening, I think, I don't mean to interrupt you either, Heather, but I, I think we must be talking past each other something because when when I, or, you know, I used to say, we talk to uh, the neighbors, they don't feel that way at all. I mean, what we hear is, uh, you know, staff will never meet, we, they don't communicate with us, we never know what's going on, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And so it, it's really kind of discordant, you know, hearing from them. And so that's what I think we're trying to do is to say, okay, how can we best, you know, kind of get this, this group, and I'm including, you know, the department and, and neighbors and tenants together to have, you know, better or more effective conversations. And, and so that's what I, and I think that's what Brady's talking about, you know, we got to, think about that a little more and and we welcome you know your contributions in fact those are essential so uh, i think my question for you would be is that a discussion that belongs in the modifications to this program as the new addition to this program or is that a separate conversation i mean we've talked about coming back to you to talk to talk about the barrier cost share program, which is not part of this program. Right. Um, so, I mean, is that something that fits within this framework that we want to try and get something captured here tonight or at some point, or are we talking about something different? And I, I'm not clear on that. I'm just asking. 
So I think what we're talking about is implementation. It's like, okay, how are we gonna do this better or more effectively? And so I, I'm not, personally, I'm not necessarily thinking that, you know, it's gonna be modification of the material that we're looking at, but it's going to be, okay, how do we, how do we work with the neighbors, you know, in a collaborative fashion so that what we're proposing actually makes sense uh, and, and we can do, we can accomplish. And so I don't see them as, see them as separate, but I, you know, I am a little concerned that if we go ahead and, and you know, agree to recommend, you know, the, this motion the way it is now that, you know, it's not going to address what I think is, is really the underlying, the major underlying issue, and, and that is, what are we doing? <laughs> Why don't you, Michelle, along your lines, because <clears throat> I think what I'm also hearing embedded with concerns being a neighbor is some su support right. for a good part of this. Right. So rather than taking all this away, perhaps there's a third motion, which is instructing staff to inform board on how it's addressing neighbor relations within the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations, which we have set up the annual meeting now, which was a specific recommendation coming out of that big collaborative effort. Which is good. I mean, that's which good. is good, which yeah. is, but we, right. but we could use what I guess what I'm saying is if you would instruct us to go back <clears throat> and do more work and coming forward with information on neighbor relations, as opposed to existing policy and maybe recommending where we have a gap in that or an enhancement, we can go to work on that rather than trying to craft language tonight. Maybe mm -hmm. it was an instruction back to us to come back to forward to you on how we think we could meet what I think we're hearing from you all in community and also look at the past guidance we do have on neighbor relations and to report back out on how we're doing in that regards. Uh, I think uh, if that works for you, if that's you know the best approach for you, that sounds fine. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I, I would kind of, I like the approach that Dan is proposing. Um, you know, I would hate to kick the can down the road here. Like, I, I don't want perfect to be the enemy of good, right? Like, community members talked about all the things they're excited about with this plan and the things that are positive around us bringing, you know, a team in house to help control this. Um, you know, and the other positive things that, you know, we're feeling good around, right, in this plan. Um, so to kick the can down the road and not do something tonight, you know, and move this forward feels like the wrong thing because I think we all we all want the same thing here, right? And are there ways we could improve, you know, how we're working with neighbors and neighbor relations in the future? You know, probably, but you know, let's let's not slow down uh this program or you know, these improvements to it by by not taking action tonight is is kind of my take. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, John. Yeah, I think Heather, I think you make a good point. Like we're kind of conflating some things. Like there's neighbor relations writ large, and prairie dogs are a part of that, but it's a bigger issue. I heard what you're saying. It's like, does it really prairie dog plan, or is it something bigger? And I think it is. And I think your recommendation is great. Let's take a you know, if it were up to me, my policy direction is be a good neighbor. I'm like figure out what that means for us. I have no idea. But like, but like, like uh, Dave said, we're talking past each other. Like you know. We're, we just don't have same versions of reality. And of course that's never possible, but if, if, if we could get to a point where um, we're, we're, the, the neighbors feel like we are good neighbors. And I, I think it, you know some separate work on that seems like a good way to solve that for tonight. My other comment was, you know, if, if when Congress is making policy or bills, they don't have a hearing at 8 p.m. and then rewrite the bill and then pass it at 11. They just don't do that. And, and so I feel a little bit like that's what we're doing. You know, it's like, we got all this input. Like, yes, it, John's point is well taken. There's some things we totally agree on and, and we can pass those things, but there's also some substantive things within the, the, the actual that is within the prairie dog stuff about, are we gonna, you know, people over and over say, commit to the 200 
acres of control every year. And, and I don't know the extent to which we're comfortable with that. Maybe we know we can't commit to that right now. Another thing I've heard over and over again, which we haven't discussed yet, which is, is committing to a specific percentage in the Northern project area, because there's a number of neighbors who are worried that by expanding the project area, we're gonna go for lower hanging fruit somewhere else and, and, and kind of abandon our commitments. And, and so I don't know how between now and whenever we wanna to go to bed, we're gonna address that within this motion. And so that's what I was thinking maybe would require another bite out the apple. And if that is, yeah, that's, that was just my, so I think there are some substantive things with the, with the Prairie Dog specific issue that people brought up that I don't know how we're gonna resolve it right now. Mm -hmm. But that was my, my suggestion is, is basically if we can add a bit of specificity to this, and then I, I do think, you know, if there's some uh, flexibility or if, I think your suggestion is a good one. And, um, and I don't know how kind of to best fit that in here, but, um, it, you know, and John, you're right. We, th there's some very good things here that we don't want to lose, but I don't see losing them in just taking uh, a little more time to kind of try to coalesce our thinking so that it makes sense both for staff <coughs> and for the public. So it, it would certainly be very helpful for me if we do have a future time that we're talking to you about this to understand what additional information would be helpful. Um, you know, we've we've had three months worth of board meetings where we've talked about and provided information on this on a field trip with you all. Um, and so it'd be really helpful to understand what 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 do you need from staff, um, or is it just additional time? to go over the public comment and, and think about it with the information that you already have. Well, and I would like to also throw in the next opportunity, which is December and January and February, which if we bring forth our recommendations for 2024, and it's 80% outside the Northern Project area and 20% in, and we get public comment on that, in which all the folks are gonna get invited and we're gonna hear it. And then we make modifications or we don't, and we come to the board and say, this is what we're planning to do. This is what we heard from the community. I think that's the time for the board to tell us we need to have our percentage in the Northern Project area increased here. Can you, is there ways you can do that? I mean, because otherwise, if we leave it alone, <clears throat> the guidance is gonna be what we run with for next year. Right. And, and, and we're not proposing any changes in that guidance. So I think the, the nuance of within it is what acres where is what we bring forward every year to get your own feedback. And we'll probably have an agenda item in January or February to say, here's what we recommended. Here's what the public told us. Here's the refinements we make. What do you all think? And if you all suggest to us or make recommendations that is there ways we can increase this or proportionally put things there, and we can have, we'll have that conversation. At that point, we have more detail about why we're making those management decisions or specific information about exactly what kind of barriers, exactly what kind of restoration, maybe not exactly, but have it narrowed down. So then you all understand more of the framework with which we're working. And if we're not doing a huge chunk, why? And what the trade-offs are. Yeah. To do that, you know. So then can I rephrase it to some understand? Yeah. You're saying we got another bite at we and the public have another bite at the apple. At the nuanced apple. This is sort of a little higher up. Right. And then every year we take this higher level up and then we bring it down to on the ground implementation. Right. So property so by what, property. That's when we talk about percentages and what's what's an A, B, C. We're gonna come forward and say we're gonna do X percent of acres of lethal control, X percent of relocations. We're gonna add things by saying. We're also going to do X percent or X amount of <clears throat> water irrigation infrastructure work to support this program. We're going to do this amount of restoration, and we're going to do this amount of coexistence work. We're going to put all that together, come to the community in December, get their feedback, and then come to you all. So that is what we've worked over the last two or three years to put in place. That's the work plan that gets established for the next year versus the, the policy that we're saying. And I, I don't know that anybody's asked, like, and it, it seems like people have suggested um, we, we want you to commit to at least 200 acres a, a year. 
that doesn't seem, I was satisfied by the explanation of that's not always possible. But it's between 100 and 200. And I mean, so I think we're, that, that um, work plan stuff is def defined later in the year. Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that, and I don't know, this may be a moving target, which I apologize for, but um, is that in uh, preparation or conduct of the annual public meeting that preliminary to that, that staff sits down with neighbors and kind of has that conversation so that you, you as staff know, okay, um, you know, he, here's what are the concerns or the suggestions out there. They hear, okay, here's what we're, you know, going to be proposing. You've had that conversation so that when you get to the annual meeting, there isn't, you know, the conversation that we never heard that or staff saying that, you know, they never told us that or whatever, so that. So a question about that, is that all neighbors adjacent to all irrigated agricultural properties? Because there will be the ones that we're recommending action on, they will be the ones that we're not recommending action on. Yeah, that we're, would we're make potentially it just talking a, about. An invitation so that, the, you know, the neighbors are self-selecting, you know, and if, if they're not interested or it's, they, it's not that they're not interested, but you know, it's not uh, where you know they're concerned about. Then they don't necessarily have to attend. And and it's related to the what we're going to be presenting at the public. Yeah, meeting. so the the they feel that they it's a preview to right. the neighbors, and that they feel the that meeting. they've participated and contributed, and that there's more of a collaborative so outcome. I think a step that we would see as a staff, right, as a to do step, would be we have a constituent list. We call it that. And we use that list to inform about this process. What I'm hearing is take a look at opportunities to broaden the constituent list to, to enhance our neighbor relations. I mean, that would be an action step, for instance, in which more people might be aware of what we're doing and there's the no surprise rule to, the, to, a, better, to a better place than we're at now, right. perhaps. Right. So you that, like I'm talking about being out there, you know, whether we, we reserve a Grange Hall or, you know, someone offers up a, a house or something so that they feel, they, neighbors and tenants feel that, you know, that we're, we're making an effort, you know, and we're coming out to their, you know, to their territory so that um, it's not necessarily everyone sitting around this table. It's, as Brady said, it's sitting around someone's dining room table you know, having this conversation. Um, and anyway, I think that would, would be more would effective. Would you see this, I mean, the approach that we've taken right now is very individualized to the specific neighbor so that we can talk about specific circumstances on their property and adjacent open space and look for solutions that way. You know, th this would be a very different kind of a conversation by necessity because each, each neighbor has individual characteristics right. of the landscape that they live on um, a neighbor engagement will be necessarily a far more general conversation than that. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, a lot of staff time is spent on those one-on-ones, which don't, don't seem to be meeting the need. So, uh, you know, is it, is it more of a general need to engage with neighbors and maybe we're wasting our time with these one-on-one -on -one engagements? Well, I, I don't if, know. If I could just, I think we're in need of a third recommendation. I don't think we're going to wordsmith something tonight specifically. I think you need to recommend that staff go back and look at current plan guidance on neighbor relations and come forth with a recommendation for how that can be improved. Okay. And uh, would it work for staff to do that in the next couple of months for that recommendation? Well, I think a piece of it, we've already committed to coming forth in September right. with so a specific do... piece of it with the cost sharing program. So we I think the other now. piece is, I think you all need to be informed with what all current policy says right. about neighbor relations. Right. So we could bring forth those so you're aware of what community groups and staff have already developed and, and progress where we're at with that. 
So that'd be step two. And then step three would be the enhancement area, which maybe by the time you all, we get to that December Q1 timeframe, we could get to work on that. I don't know where we'll, I can't promise right now where we'll right. be on it, but yeah. Okay. Heather, I guess, and I don't want to make more work, although I think, you know, this, this type of interaction with people is really, you know, a key. And so it, 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 it may be more work uh, in our estimation initially, but I think it pays great dividends in the future and the work requirement becomes less as people get to know you and the trust. I, I just want to make sure that our efforts are well, focused in the most I think it's, it's probably way. both I, initially. That's what I'm, that's what I was going to say. It, it's probably the general conversation with, you know, all the neighbors who want to participate. And then it's probably an outcome of that. You'll figure out, well, you know, I better talk to this person because, you know, they seem to have a particular issue or need or question or whatever it is. So I don't think it's a one-time deal. I think it's probably a continuing conversation and you'll have to decide that you would, people will have to decide how best to do that or how that can be most effective. But I'm seeing it as, as more than just one meeting prior to the annual meeting that you probably, you, you might need to you know, engage in so that you do get the general conversation with the neighbors and then you are able to talk more specifically on you know, specific issues with individuals. And then in the future, that may not be necessary. You know, as time goes on, that may not be really all that critical. Um, well, we have 95 neighbors who weren't here speaking to us tonight. Right? <laughs> we, got, we got a love letter from one of them. I don't know, did y'all see that? Yeah, yeah. Someone said that you removed the prairie dogs. It's and safe. it is unbelievable. And, and there's there's got to be a lot of those that right. didn't take the time to write. I didn't know it was 95 neighbors. It's like, well, so, that's, yeah. that's a lot of neighbors. So it's nice to hear that we do a good job. Yeah. You know, it's usually the, the, the other thing that we hear. I know that. Yeah. Well, so okay. Let, again, let me just reflect back. So I think I think Dan made a great recommendation about you know, the separate initiative for the neighbors. And so then, where does that leave us with? Let's 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 presume that we're going to do a great job with that at the future time. Um, and where does that leave us with the the, the the issue at hand, which is the prairie dogs motion? Um, I think if you took a look at A through F, this is just my opinion. What I'm, what I've heard is that B, C, D, and E are. I, I don't know if if there's any. I, I, I kind of feel like we're all on the same page on that. I might be totally naive, um, but uh, expand it expand to uh, address other lands, uh, uh, irrigation lands, uh, implement uh, lethal control internally, uh, cease relocation based on policy guidance and other plans, identify funding and capacity to address the irrigation infrastructure. I think if there are issues, it's with A and F. F is already current. We're just basically staying that current policy allows this to happen if you want us not to include that in the modification and we, we I think our current policy if we wanted if we needed to make a modification we still could but we would come forth and let you and the community all know about it but if you're uncomfortable bringing F forward that could be a, a compromise for you all if you want to reword a little bit of A so instead of evaluate properties, describe properties based on individual characteristics, because we're already doing that. We need our water infrastructure folks need to know what properties are most important to you for us to improve. We use this internal spreadsheet to say, hey, here are the properties that really need to go to work on. Could you build this into your work plan? So that's already being done. If you'd rather not daylight, have us daylight that publicly, that's fine. We can... No, I think we want more daylight than less. No, right. Well, this this was an attempt to 
provide more daylight. So I think the word evaluate may be confusing. Yeah, I think and if right. you all want to just yeah. change that word to describe pro properties based on individual, could in, in that in the, the <clears throat> transparency thing, one I think it was Kevin or someone else suggested that there be basically a little data sheet on every property that says, you know, here's and you update it at whatever period it makes sense. Here's roughly how many prairie dogs are, you know, occupation. Here's the plan. He he laid it out fairly explicitly in his email. They sent it at three o'clock today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it, does that resonate? Did you all is that is, is something on those lines? I have to imagine that data exists. It oh, it absolutely does. Right. So, I mean, maybe not at the level of detail in one place that he was talking about. Yeah. So well, something that I do want to raise, and I, I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but Dave will remember in the grassland plan. This is something that we had to talk about a lot. Is um, with water rights, we do need to be careful about committing or documenting conditions that would limit our ability to use those water rights, because that actually sets the city up for um, actions to claim that we're not fully using our water rights, and we set ourselves up for the potential to lose them in that case. So there's a little bit of a nuance there that, that some of the details around um, irrigation infrastructure and water rights, um, we may need to generalize a little bit. So I like uh, Dan's suggestion just on replacing the uh, evaluate with describe. I think you're, you're pointing out the areas of uh, agreement are right. I would suggest that for the purpose of this memo or uh, motion that we eliminate F okay. for the time being. Um, and then I, I do think we need to probably have a little uh, better description of the irrigation element if we're gonna keep it in there just to, you're right, Heather, just to kind of address, I, I'm not sure that this, um, language is sufficient. Uh, I guess my feeling would be we we might want to be less specific in, in the language here as far as irrigation and just look at and evaluate irrigation infrastructure, you know, to determine if it, uh, you know, is sufficient to meet the needs of the property or something like that and leave it at that for the time being. Does that provoke any further comment? What was your recommendation? Are you striking? Something so, about E. Yeah, so what's, what's happening with E? So F is gone. F is gone. Evaluate e. is now described in A, but what happened to E? E is um, it identify irrigation infrastructure needs. Um, that, you know, required to make you know, get the property into agricultural production or something. So it's a little more general than than uh, what's here. And it meets. Uh, I'm trying to meet what you you know what your ca your cautionary you know tale is that I agree that we don't want to put language in there that uh, is going to mess up you know uh, our ability to. Get or use water rights, especially when it's when there are improvements planned or in progress, or and we're capturing a, a status in time right. that, that may not be you know right. where we're headed, and so we want to be kind of careful about that. Do you have a suggestion on how to edit that then? Well, what I just said, except for whatever I say, oh, always changes. Uh, <laughs> well, but, 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 okay, so Dan and Heather, do you think it's problematic as written? Um, I think it's a little, I think its intent was a little bit different. I, I think what you're saying would have to happen along with. Yeah, I'm just saying looking at the irrigation infrastructure in order to, you know, get the, or, um, what, get the property back into agricultural production sounds pretty lame, but that's basically it. Is the irrigation infrastructure sufficient to, um, you know, 
deliver water to the property. And I, I don't think we ought to talk about water. We're assuming that whatever water rights are associated with the property are the water rights. So it's the infrastructure that is really the key. It's not the water rights. Um, well, the, the whole reason, what Dan said previously, the whole reason that this is even included in a prairie dog recommendation is because you all wanted to remind yourselves in the world, basically, that if, if you can't irrigate the land, uh, immediately after removing the prairie dogs, we perhaps shouldn't have removed the prairie dogs. And we should have put that those efforts elsewhere. Is but that the right? The infrastructure though is the delivery system. And that's been that seems to be the key issue. Is the delivery system adequate enough to deliver yes and the no. water? Yes and no. There are some of these properties that do not have water rights associated with them currently. And where did that's, those water rights go? Do you know? Um, in some cases, they were transferred to properties where they could be used. We we did that. Yes, because the, because the infrastructure was not sufficient to use them on the property, and you need to use them. So none of these are recent actions. And we could transfer that, those water rights back. Potentially, I I don't know the nuances of those property by property. Okay. That would be part of what we're digging into is the exact conditions on those. I mean, some of those situations have happened in the not too distant past. Some of those have been the situation for a long time. So some of those are gonna require digging back into water records and that, that kind of thing that's gonna take some doing. How do you make those decisions annually on an annual basis? Well, we, we have a water administration program. Um, and so that program lead is keeping an eye on the water rights. And if there's an underutilized water right, that person would identify that it's underutilized and look, and look at options to get it used. So we don't. So that we don't lose it. And that, that's more doable in some situations than others. Some ditch systems allow fairly quick and easy transfer of water rights to another property. Um, some properties, the water rights, um, they were being irrigated, the conditions like the soil quality and stuff were very low quality conditions. And there was within the same ditch system, another property that was very high value, good soil with a lessee that was a little bit short on water. And so the decision was made to use it where it would have the most benefits. So, I mean, I think each one's its own situation. And like I said, some of them were more recent than others. Um, some of them that actually happened as part of the acquisition. So some of these are historically irrigated, but have never been able to be irrigated since the property. And I hear some purchased. people saying, hey, it was historically irrigated, commit to irrigating it again. But what you're saying is the world has changed to an extent that that may not be possible. Possibly. Again, I, I don't have any specific examples of any of these yet. So does this language... <clears throat> Uh, Sorry, go ahead. This language in E, I, I guess what I'm hearing is that if staff, if you're okay with the language in E, we're probably okay with it. I, I'm not concerned about it at a general level like this. I, I think it's more when we're doing individual okay. property descriptions mm -hmm. where it would be a specific water right, a specific property. You know, we, we just want to be sure that we're capturing the intent of, of that situation. Okay. And I think what we heard consistently in the public comment tonight and in the written comment was, please keep the agricultural lands agricultural lands. And, and th that's what I heard. Right. Yes. And, and I think that's right. absolutely our intent. I think if, and I will say if, because we haven't determined this, if there are situations where that is simply not possible. Right. I think we would do ourselves service to acknowledge that. Right, right. And then say, okay, we're gonna, it's gonna be native. It's, it's gonna be native grass. It's native grass land. We hate, we, we, but the development went in, the infrastructure is gone, and we'd have to condemn existing property, you know, like the, the situation, the hypothetical that you and I discussed the other day. There may be situations in which it's just not feasible. And we're not, the, you're not saying you're gonna determine that now or even within the next year, but we have to acknowledge that that case may be, may exist. And, and, you know, in the interest of transparency, I would much rather have that conversation and be very clear about that than yeah. keep a property on a list of like, well, maybe we'll get to it someday when we know full well that's not. Yeah, or is that, was that what category D is? 
in some cases, but not all of those. No, some of those have things that can change on them. Uh -huh. So being in category D just identifies that, you know, these are going to take some some real focused planning and efforts and probably some of the resources identified in E to be focused on them to move them into a different situation. Right. And I guess, I don't know if this would be a recommendation, but I guess what I heard is some people wanting a little more nuance to know, okay, within those D properties, which are the ones that are, you know, in the cities you're worth the effort to get them back and which are the ones that maybe in your heart of hearts you're thinking, this is probably destined to be a native grasslands in a conservation area. You know, it's that that level of transparency, I think, is something that people are interested in. And I think over the years, and I know we'll get there. I mean, this is our first attempt at using this spreadsheet. We we have been trying to sort of here are the properties where we think it is. <clears throat> I think we're gonna always analyze that. We're gonna analyze current conditions. <clears throat> and I think I think the intent is if there is one in D where we feel like maybe it should be a native grassland. I think right. what we're committed to is someday stating that. Yeah. And, and I think that that was part of the intention of F is if we have a proper property where the, re, the realities and the intention is for it to be a native grassland. then it's not appropriate for it to carry a management designation that's tied to irrigated agriculture because that just is a confusing situation that makes things difficult for people to understand. Uh -huh. So I definitely support that, but I think that that is a conversation that probably awaits a later time. Yeah, that's fine. Sure. And and just in full transparency, I think we have the policy guidance. If we did have an example, to bring it forward anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. Right. So if we're, let me see if I can move this. If we're okay with E, we'll leave that language the way it is, uh, we'll get rid of F. And I, what I was going to suggest is language like, you know, provide open space board. Of, so there would be maybe a three, which would be what we talked about, provide the open space board with recommendations for improving uh, neighbor relations or something like that. But also with a report on the current reality, you know, because you, you mentioned that. There's existing guidance and, and there's things we're already doing. And I think the only thing that we can, well, I, I can definitively say is there's evidence that we can. Right. So would that be, uh, would, would you be okay, Dan, with that being a three? Yes, that, that was what I was bringing for it. So let's do that. Um, maybe provide Open Space Board with recommendations uh, with assessment of the current uh, uh, neighbor relations situation and recommendations for improving and strategies to enhance neighbor relations. That would be nice. All right. Are you getting that, Megan? Nope. <laughs> 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 okay. Dan's got it. Okay. <laughs> Just for the the shared screen, could, could yeah, you repeat that? Um, to uh, request that staff report out on current neighbor relations guidance and implementation and to develop a strategy to enhance neighbor relations and communications. I didn't say anything. Is that okay? Neighbor. I guess the only thing would be, I mean, it, it lives here in this conversation. So I assume we're talking about neighbors to prairie dog occupied yes. irrigated right. agricultural lands. We could put that in if you oh, yeah. related related to the to the program of reducing conflict on irrigated agriculture. But, lands. What, but we're I mean, is it but we did agree that it was a bigger issue, or is it is it okay to live? But I think with? it's different issues in different yeah. parts of the system. Right. I mean, our, our western edge with neighbors is going to be, you know, we're talking yeah. about um, fire. We're talking. I mean, it's very we have seventy miles of urban wildland interface. Right, that's, that's our reality. Let, let's <laughs> let's take this step. Okay, see how it goes. Then we can deal with a, a larger okay uh, situation. So at the end, specific to the program of reducing prairie dog conflict on irrigated agricultural lands. Specific to the program. Sorry. I missed that too. I'm sorry. I'm trying to also follow. Specific to the program of reducing prairie dog prairie dog conflict on OSD's irrigated agricultural lands. But that doesn't, sorry, but that, that doesn't include the weed issue, which I think is for some people is even bigger. Right. 
does that preclude us from talking about when the city is going to be knowing when the city is going to going to be mowing and, and having confidence that the city will mow before things go to seed? And that wouldn't be captured in that motion. <laughs> well, probably it could. Some of it could. I mean, we have a whole separate weed management program under Chris Warner that we reported out to you all on last year. So, but I, Eric, were you going to say something? Yeah, yeah, I was basically going to say what you said that um, as part of these project sites, it would, it would, it's, it's part of the program to do vegetation management um, for rehab. But yes, that's a Pandora's box to restoration vegetation management as well. So, um, but, but we definitely can clarify that part of the rehabilitation process includes A, B, C, D, and E, and F, and all the things that we have to do, and vegetation management is part of that, if that makes sense. General milling isn't part of this process, though. What's that? I don't know. It's part of this process. That's what I'm trying to get clarification on. I mean, it, all actions on OSMP adjacent to neighbor's lands so much there's there's some interaction with neighbors so i mean it's I, i'm just trying to put sideboards so we have something in in some way manageable to be looking at because all neighbor relations everywhere related to all open space management is the can that be part of this future yeah i'm okay with that and i think <clears throat> If we come forth with, yeah. here's what we think we heard, here's what we're thinking, and if we miss the mark, you can let us know. Right. I think for our purposes at this okay. point, that probably serves sufficiently. Am I missing a word in three? It reads weird. Help. <laughs> Relation, uh, neighbor and current neighbor relations guidance and implement Strategy. and strategies. Right? Yeah, specific to the point. Okay. Yeah, it's just it, it, one last comment. It's just interesting. Yeah. Like, do we need another rubric, or do we just need to think deeply about what it means to be a good neighbor? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I think it, it's it, it's like anyway. I think that's a conversation for another time. Maybe. Yeah, okay. and I would actually yeah, and. And I don't, I, I, I'm gonna make a comment and it's not meant, so we heard great comments from nine community members. If this was 2018 or 2017, we probably would have had 90 to 150. Yeah, right. So I think we've come a long way. Right. And the reason that we maybe aren't hearing from even more is because we have addressed 95 neighbors some of the concerns of 95 neighbors right. already. So, fair point. And the Prairie Dogs advocates, if I can use that term, um, we really didn't, haven't heard from, and I'm assuming are pretty supportive of what we're doing. Don't feel the need to address us. Uh, so, I think we're ready for a motion. Is is this does this include the uh, the cost share on the fence line? Is that was there is, or is that is that need to be part of this motion or is that just going to? We're be coming forward in September with that. If you feel like in September we didn't honor that or said you could make a motion. Okay, but well that doesn't need to be included. Yeah, I, I think I think it probably will show up in this in addition to what we come up with for you in September because I think it's part of neighbor relations. Yeah. Right. So it could be you're hearing it yeah. twice. Yeah. But I think we committed to writing that memo for September. Yeah. You ready? Excellent. Yeah. What? I'm gonna make some motion. <laughs> I'll, I'll to make it honor. if you prefer. Uh, so the way this works is I say I move and then with the, my eyesight as it exists today, I have to read this whole thing on this one. Okay. That's, so that's why everybody's got a screen. Why I do. can't see that. Okay. okay. Uh, I move that the Open Space Board of Trustees, I move the Open Space Board of Trustees to one, recommend that staff implement modifications to the management approach of reducing 
prairie dog conflict on irrigated agricultural properties beginning in 2024, including uh, describe properties based on individual characteristics, including challenges and opportunities for use in support of the prioritization criteria applied in selecting management sites each year. B, expand implementation of the project beyond the previously determined northern project areas to encompass irrigable agricultural properties system-wide that are designated as transition and removal areas and replace the existing borough disturbance rule to allow borough disturbance to a depth of six inches system-wide or 12 inches with prior notification on OSMP irrigated agricultural land. C, implement lethal control, barrier maintenance, and other related tasks in-house by purchasing equipment and adding staff to complete this work rather than by hiring contractors. D, cease relocation to the southern grasslands as directed by the grassland plan unless occupation drops below 10% in the future. Evaluate alternative uh, alternate receiving sites, including prairie dog conservation areas and receiving sites off OSMP and pursue if found, if feasible. If receiving sites are not available and thus relocation is not feasible, explore alternate removal options, such as trapping, donating to programs for raptor rehabilitation or black-footed ferret recovery. E, identify funding and capacity to address irrigation infrastructure needs ahead of prairie dog removal on properties where irrigated agriculture is limited by irrigate irrigation infrastructure, That's number one. Number two, recommend that city council approves modifications in geographic scope of the program to expand implementation of the project, including the use of lethal control beyond the previously defined Northern project area to encompass irrigable agricultural properties system-wide that are designated as transition and removal areas. This approval should include replacement of the existing borough disturbance rule to allow borough disturbance to a depth of six inches or 12 inches with prior notification system-wide on irrigated agricultural properties. And then three, that was a bonus move, uh, request that staff report out on current neighbor relations guidance and strategies specific to the program of reducing prairie dog conflict and LSMPs, irrigated agricultural lands. I second. Any further discussion? And I'll... All the roll. Michelle? Yes. Brady? Yes. John? Yes. And I vote yes as well. It passes unanimously. And thank you all very much for hanging in there and doing a good job. We appreciate it and look forward to further conversations in the not too distant future. <laughs> I just want to acknowledge your comment, Dan, and, and, and that the city has made ma massive progress in this regard, much of which I didn't bear witness to. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I think that was absolutely a fair comment, and, and I hear that. And, I, and it's a testimony to many of you as well. Thanks for the great discussion. <laughs> and I'm losing my voice. I know. <laughs> no one noticed, though, right? I know. I'm joking. Of course. So we're at uh, matters from the department. Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, verbal updates. Um, just wanted to uh, uh, call your attention to an email I put out right before July 1st, which was the e-bike implementation date of uh, steps we've been taking over the last 45 days to uh, ready ourselves for implementation. Just wanted to acknowledge that over 70 new signs um, have now been posted system-wide along with the removal and modification of existing signs. We realize that we might have a gap or two and we're certainly open to finding out where those are and we need, but Jeff, I think we're probably over 90% of the way completed with that sign project. Um, and yeah, certainly if, if you wanna make us aware of any sign replacements you think is still needed. We're certainly open to uh, receiving that. The interactive trail map has been updated to pick the trails that allow you biking. Trailhead maps are being updated to reflect the change. Uh, in our agency coordination, just wanted to call out the attention that Boulder County, uh, since our approval has already moved uh, through their board and commission to expand uh, where e-bikes are uh, now allowed on county, prop county managed properties which includes Colton, Mayhop, Mayhopper, Singletree, and Boulder Canyon trails that they are responsible for managing. Uh, communication plan, as hopefully you've seen, we've done a lot of work on e-bike messaging on our webpage. We put out press releases, social media, next door posts, field notes, 
uh, e -news newsletter update, we actually received a thousand clicks and our most recent one, which is the most clicks I think we've ever had on our, uh, on a uh, field note article. Um, obviously messaging our Rangers and outreach staff, we've met with them specifically on this and uh, have geared up our messaging program for that. In terms of long-term uh, implementation, we've already taken a, a couple of steps to be able to add new data collection. We had a couple of visitation counters that were due to be installed out in the system. So we've used that opportunity to install at uh, East Boulder Trail and South Boulder Trail respectively. So now we'll have more visitation data uh, uh, to incorporate in our system-wide monitoring that is occurring. And so we're already starting to collect some visitation data uh, that those trail counters allow us to get. Those were installed right before July 1st. So we should have a good uh, uh, background information now um, starting immediately when the uh, program was implemented. Uh, in terms of just one, uh, 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 so we've already highlighted in our memos that um, e-bikes will now be included in all, all of our visitation survey, all of the ways that we monitor passive recreational uses, and we're building that out into our, our surveys that were uh, uh, happening as well as our visitation counters. But I do want to address the issue of adaptive management. And I would just like to point out that from a staff perspective, and we may be on a different page, but a staff perspective, you know, we have the big wheel of adaptive management, which is seven steps, very robust. In this case, we feel like we just completed an adaptive management process in which we had 14 months of a process. We informed staff of what our approach was. We collected data, we assessed information, what was going on. We moved to what's the third step of what are our desired conditions and we laid out uh, consistency and regulations, visitor experience. We laid out what our desired uh, 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 conditions should be. We then explored what our, our value, uh, our alternatives are. We updated, uh, uh, we suggested management program guidance updates. We received that. And, uh, guidance we are now implementing. So we feel like we're at wheel number seven, which we have described as the small wheel, which is continuing to monitor, continuing to, um, um, and based on the monitoring to make adjustments. So from an adaptive management, we feel like for this year and the upcoming near future that we're on number seven, we're more than prepared to put information in place uh, and to look at trends over time. And if we're starting to see any changes in trends, whether it's for biking or hiking or horseback riding or paragliding or any of those other recreational use, we'll be more than willing to have a staff conversation about that and a board conversation about that. So uh, I just wanted to make that reference to adaptive management and, uh, and, the, and the feeling like from our perspective, we just got done circling the big wheel on this issue. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, before uh, we go to Heather, <laughs> um, Jeff, I just want to check with you on what Pat Billy uh, comments and uh, Wendy Sweets uh, as well. So, uh, are we kind of uh, in in place as far as uh, what you've been working with them on? I think so. I, I mean, I would say that's kind of what Dan's referencing there. It's just work we've done to date. And then I think we have a good baseline data set that we've tracked and monitored up until this point that we have in place to look at if we do see trends changing, just like any recreational activity. Um, I think yeah. the concern is, uh, uh, you know, the system wide approach right. as opposed to you know kind of there may be specific trails that um, you know are kind of exhibiting uh, different situations than perhaps uh, the system-wide yeah. uh, data might show and so are, are we being sophisticated enough that we can look at you know specific trails if we need to as far as what's going on I believe so and, and the Human Dimensions team that they meant, um, Wendy and Pat both mentioned in their comments earlier, um, the way they track data and Heather can speak to this as well. 
um, you know, a site specific as well. So we can look at a specific trail and how is that comparing to what we see system wide? Um, right. If there's right. some anomalies or increase in certain, you know, um, in fact, some of the data we've already shared with Pat and Wendy um, showed again some of that baseline where you can see how many percentage are hiking or biking or horseback is damaged. And so if we start seeing spikes in some areas or not, you know, we'll we'll have that specific to that trail location or where the counter was observing that. So and I think the concern is uh, obviously on the two trails that you know that have been mentioned uh, in you know habitat conservation areas, right. especially you know the special designated areas. Um, you know, kind of are, are they functioning the way that we anticipate they should? Be? Yeah. And and I think that the one caution with that is it is important to evaluate that data in a system wide context right. because there may be unrelated things happening that are causing a shift on those particular trails. So we have to look at those trails in the context of the full system to make sure that it's, you know, not an overall trend that we're seeing or a movement from here to here, you know, rather than people no longer using the trail system. So there's a little bit of nuance there in, in pulling out an individual site and, um, you know, so, some risk for, for interpreting the data in a way that may or may not be representative of, of what's actually going on. All right. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. A couple of other quick updates. Just want to let you all know that the tall oak grass grazing project is completed for the year. So the uh, cows are out of the Shanahan Ridge area and we had a great year. I uh, felt like we've made some good progress for that. And just to uh, call out your attention to this weekend, we are going to uh, be doing a short term closure of Bluebell Road. We're going to be doing some major repairs to that road uh, this weekend. And uh, then there was the question too of with all this moisture, boy, it's great for our native plants, but it also could be really beneficial for our invasive plants. And, um, and there was a desire to speak to a little bit about how we might be addressing invasives in a wet year. Um, so I don't know, I just asked Heather if she wouldn't mind having to come and that that's the subject that the board wants us to come back to in terms of our plant management and specifically doing bases, we're more than happy to dig a little deeper for you all. But I don't know if you've had any quick comments on sure, that. Sure, yeah. I mean, I talked with Kelly Ewing, who heads up our um, uh, vegetation management program. And, you know, it's a banner year for vegetation across the board, including noxious weeds. Um, so, you know, we are seeing that, that some species, sulfur sink foil is one that seemed to be especially prolific. Other species, may just be far more grand in their height or their spread this year, not necessarily more prolific in numbers, um, but certainly across the board, it's a great year for weeds. So our, our planning is largely done in the same way, regardless of climactic conditions. A lot of that planning you know, happens at the beginning of the season and it, it's largely prioritized by um, state we list status, so A status species are the top priority. They're flagged for eradication. And so a lot of our efforts up to this point of the season have been focused on those, um, especially Mediterranean sage that has a very narrow window within which we have to treat it each year um, before it flowers and then immediately when it flowers if we've missed it. And that that's actually resulted in the removal of 15,000 plants this year, which is pretty consistent with last year, but way down from 21, which is great because it's removal of every single plant that we find. And we do see that reducing over time. So we're making some headway. Um, and then also with um, myrtle spurge have been the two. So now the, the focus shifts to other A-list species, um, purple loose strife and others that have a different seasonality than those first two and moving then to B-list species like sulfur sank foil and, and others. And this year with um, the amount of areas that need to be tackled, um, Kelly's working on hiring a, a commercial applicator contractor to supplement what our in-staff efforts can be to try and make a little bit more headway on that. And really with those species, we're looking at each, um, each occurrence and seeing whether it's something that we can actually target for eradication, if it's kind of small enough that we can do that, or are we looking at containment, or are we just looking at trying to kind of knock it back? And that just really depends on the characteristics of each 
individual infestations. So it's not really a different approach than it is in a dry year, although we add resources when we can um, to supplement what we're doing when needed, which is kind of the approach that they're taking with some of the species this year. So is it your feeling that uh, we're kind of keeping abreast of uh, what's happening out there? Um, I don't know that, I mean, we, we don't do system-wide mapping on an annual basis, so that would be kind of based on the impressions of the crew and where they've been. We are certainly getting a lot more reports of weed infestations, many of which we know about already, and, and some of that may be related to there actually being more out there, and some of it might be the you know, the degree to which they're very highly visible. I mean, yeah, right. I was driving on Broadway and the corner of Broadway and Iris has some thistle that are way taller than I am and it's an impenetrable wall. And I've certainly never noticed thistle there before, but I'm sure it's been there. It just didn't look anything like that. So, wow, that's <laughs> yeah. thistle. I think we have some of that dynamic as well, but it's been very helpful actually, because we've gotten a lot of um, calls from the public alerting us to infestations, some of which we didn't know about probably because they were small and not very visible um, and hadn't been picked up. So species on the bee list like sulfur sink foil, uh, we may not get to, or what do you? Well, so we start in the areas where it's the most substantial of an issue or areas where we think we can make a, so we try to prioritize our efforts where we think we can make a difference too. Um, and so areas where we think we can actually eradicate it, if we can do that this year, then we don't have to deal with it again there. And then those areas where we can contain it. And then we kind of last get to the areas where we can just sort of treat it and try to keep it at a low enough level that it's not you know, taking over or spreading significantly. So it, it sort of depends on the location and the infestation and what other infestations are nearby. Um, certainly focusing on areas adjacent to trails is one priority because that's a potential vector for weed spread. And so we wanna minimize that to the degree that we can um, so that we're not moving at big distances across the system where possible. Right. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any closing That's it comments? Matters. Great. I will declare the meeting of